Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So, if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. The content of this story can be disturbing to some, hence, viewer discretion is advised. This is a true incident that happened during my college days. My roommate, Maria, was a party animal, while I, on the other hand, was a shy, awkward girl. I've been like that since high school, which is why I never really had that many friends. Maria became quite popular in college. She was beautiful and highly extrovert at the same time. She often forced me to go partying and nightclubbing with her. Out of boredom and loneliness, I started to hang out with her and her friends. There was a guy named Ed who used to flirt with Maria a lot. He's probably like the one guy who can go to any extent to gain female attention. Sometimes he ended up doing really stupid things, but his charming nature saved him from embarrassments whenever he made a fool out of himself. One chilly winter day, I was sitting in the cafeteria having my lunch. Maria came in and said, Hey Cheryl, are you up for a slumber party tonight? Um, is it gonna be at our place? I asked awkwardly. Well, the location is a surprise. Are you up for it or not? She asked. Honestly, I had nothing to do that night except my laundry. So I thought to myself, it'll be good for me, you know, to socialize a bit. So I agreed. Ed was standing near the food counter. He said, See you ladies tonight. Maria, hey, I'll text you the address. We came home and Maria started to pack for the party. In a confused voice, I said, So where is this going to take place? Maria laughed and said, We don't know. What? What do you mean you don't know? I said, Maria turned around and said in a mysterious voice, I mean, we haven't decided the house yet. I wasn't getting anything she was saying, so I asked her, Maria, you guys are making me worried now. What are you up to? She got close to me and whispered, You'll see, and left the room. Later that evening, my mom called me, asking to see what my plans were for tonight. I told her I am about to spend the night at a friend's house. She said, Good, I always tell you to socialize with Cheryl. After talking with her for about 30 minutes, I lied down on my bed. A sense of doubt started to grow in me. What are these people up to? I hope they don't do anything dangerous. At around 9, Maria and I finished our dinner. Maria received a text from Ed that read, Meet us at the vacant lot on IMR Street. Now, my eyes widened in tension. I said, Maria, are we going to barge into some random abandoned house for a slumber party? Maria said in an irritated tone, God, Cheryl, can you just chill for a sec? Look, if you don't want to come, you can stay back and do your laundry. I felt a bit hurt by her words, but at the same time I realized if I didn't go with them tonight, they might never invite me to another party. I didn't say anything more and sat quietly in the car. Maria drove the car on the highway and took a left turn. We got onto a dark and dusty road. The vacant lot in IMR Street is an infamous place. Many terrifying incidents have taken place there. Drug dealers and burglars take shelter in those empty houses. After half an hour, we reached our destination. We got out of the car and I checked my phone. It was 10.30 already. Standing in a vacant lot at that time gave me goosebumps. Maria was about to call Ed when we heard footsteps nearby. I got spooked immediately and turned around to see who it was. Just then, Ed jumped on me saying, <laughs> got you, Cheryl! I almost screamed with terror. I pushed him away, saying, Not funny, Ed. He started to laugh like an idiot. Ed's roommate, Matt, said, Come on, Ed, knock it off. Enough with your silly jokes. Let's just start this party. The four of us parked our cars under a big oak tree and started to walk down the alley. Old, worn-out wooden houses were scattered around us. Maria pointed out the last house on our left and said, That one! Ed looked at her and replied, 
That's the one, then. Come on, let's go. In a nervous voice, I said, Um, guys, is this a good idea? I mean, what if someone's already in there? Matt then said, Then we'll be in trouble. Maria said, Shut up, you two. There is no one in that house. Can't you see how dark and quiet it is? Ed pushed the door, and it opened on its own. All of us checked the house, and there wasn't anybody inside. There wasn't any electricity either, so we lit some candles around us. Maria turned on some music. Ed brought beers for everyone, and we started the party. After half an hour, I also thought to myself that maybe this wasn't entirely a bad idea. Sometimes taking a little risk can be fun. Around midnight, everyone was drunk, so we paused the music and started to chat. Everyone was sharing their experiences of college life when suddenly Maria said, Hey, do you want to play a game? Ed smirked at her and said, I would love to play games with you, and then laughed flirtatiously. Maria responded saying, Oh, stop. I'm talking about a different type of game. I asked, What game do you want to play? Maria stared at us for a second and said, Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Matt and I laughed. Ed said, Sure, who wants to be the dead body? Everyone exchanged looks, but no one volunteered. After a moment of awkward silence like this, Ed said, Fine, I'll be the dead body. He then laid down on the floor. Maria placed a candle close to us so that we could see him properly. She then said in a low voice, Everyone gather around him, making a circle, and place your two fingers under him. Matt and I did exactly what she said. I was feeling so drunk that this entire situation made me feel like I was in a different world. Maria also placed her finger and said, Ed, I want you to be completely relaxed. Start to think you have no weight, that you are light as a feather. Ed chuckled once and said, <laughs> Okay. Hope this works. Maria said, Be serious! And then closed her eyes. There was dead silence around us. Maria said in a low tone, Everyone says with me, Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. We joined her in the chanting. I don't know how long we continued like this. But suddenly, I felt like there was nothing on my hands. I moved my hand, but I touched the empty floor. We all opened our eyes and were shocked. Ed wasn't on the floor. Matt said, Oh my god, is this all real? Maria was shocked too. Maybe she didn't expect such an incident. All of us were sitting with blown out faces, thinking did this ritual make Ed float away? And things like that. Right at that moment, Ed came out from the dark corner of the room and started to laugh. <laughs> Look at all you fools. You guys are total douchebags, man. You thought I'd float away? We all got up off the floor, embarrassment covering our faces. Maria got angry and said, You're not funny, Ed. You're just a... But before she could finish, Ed's face started turning pale. He got completely quiet and started looking here and there. I said, What happened, Ed? What is it? He replied, Don't you guys feel the air? I, I mean, I don't know what happened, but what we saw next made our stomachs drop. Suddenly, something lifted Ed into the air and bashed him hard onto the ceiling. Ed screamed at the top of his lungs. We all watched him floating in the air with big eyes. Something then threw him hard on the floor, and we heard the sound of a neck snapping. Ed stopped screaming immediately, but his body kept moving up and down. It was being bashed repeatedly, once on the ceiling and then to the floor, like a kid playing a sick joke on its poor toy. Blood started to splatter all over the room, and Ed's brain came out from his skull. It was like a gory scene from a Hollywood movie. I don't remember how we managed to leave the house and call the cops that night. The cops are still investigating this case. 
We got into some serious trouble as we had to face rough interrogation on what we were doing in a vacant lot that night. But they couldn't find us guilty for our friend's unfortunate death. Honestly, whatever that thing was that killed Ed ruthlessly that night might still be living in that empty, abandoned house. This incident has made my life miserable. For the last 10 years, I haven't seen any one of my family. I was five years old and about to turn six. I never met my father. My mom told me he left her at a very young age. I was raised by mostly just my mother and my grandma. Many people cherish childhood memories, but I curse mine. We weren't rich, but I came from a financially stable household. I was a shy kid, which made me an easy target to bullies. My only friend, Amanda, always watched my back. It was before my 10th birthday, and my mom came to pick me up from school. As we got in the car, she asked me, So, you're turning 10 tomorrow. How about a themed birthday party? I smiled and said, What theme, mom? She replied, Well, we're going to put up decorations in the backyard and order your favorite strawberry cake. You can invite your friends. It'll be fine, Jeremy. I got excited about hearing the plans my mom made. After coming home, my mom and grandma started with the birthday arrangements. I called Amanda and invited her. My mom phoned her neighbors and invited them to the party tomorrow. With a big smile on my face, I went to bed that night. The next morning, my mom woke me up. I got so many presents. By afternoon, our backyard was flooding with cheerful kids and their parents. There were balloons everywhere. Amanda and I were playing when a kid from our neighborhood said in a loud voice, Look, there's a clown here. I looked over, and sure enough, I saw a man dressed in a clown costume standing in the distance. His red-colored hair and funky clothes made him look funny. He had a big red smile on his white-painted face. His eyes were big and shiny. He said in a squeaky voice, So where's the birthday boy? Amanda said, Jeremy's here. The clown suddenly looked at me and our eyes met. He smiled even bigger than before and walked towards me in a very weird way. He leaned in towards my face and I got a bit creeped out. He said in the same voice, So Jeremy, you're a big boy now. I have a special gift for you. And then laughed. I wasn't happy to see this guy at my birthday, but I guess clowns are common at birthday parties, so I didn't think too much about it. If I'm being honest, I had no fear of clowns whatsoever, but this guy gave me some really weird vibes. And I said in a hesitated tone, Um, what gift? He put his hand inside his pocket, and then took out a wooden box. As I opened the box, I saw a set of colored pencils. It was a generous gift, and I thanked the clown. The clown laughed again and said, I guess we're friends now, Jeremy. I stood there silently with an uncomfortable face. I didn't know what to say. That's when my mom came in and patted my back, saying it was time to cut the cake. The clown looked at my mom, and his face changed. It was clear he didn't like the interruption. Anyways, everyone gathered around the cake placed on the wooden table. Ten candles were lit on the cake. As I lifted the knife to cut it, the clown said, Make a wish first, Jeremy. I'm sure it'll come true. I blew the candles, and honestly didn't wish for anything. The birthday party was going well. The clown was interacting with other kids, but whenever I looked at him, he looked back at me and smiled. I was sitting on the swing and having my cake when Marco came to me. Now, Marco was a bully at my school. We studied in the same class and unfortunately lived in the same neighborhood too. He was often really mean to me. I didn't want any trouble that day, so I sat quietly. Marco started to tease me, saying how boring the party was. I didn't react, but suddenly he said, Maybe if you had a dad, your party would have been more fun, and started to laugh at me. I felt very insulted by this remark, so I said in an angry voice, Well, you can leave then. No one wants you here, Marco. Marco's face turned all red, and he pushed me off the swing. It was a low swing, so I didn't get hurt, but my cake fell on the ground. My parents came to stop the fight, and his mother apologized for his behavior. My mom shrugged it off, saying things like this often happen in kids. I got really angry and went to my room. My mom kept calling me to come back, but I sat near my bedroom window trying to cool off the anger. I could see the entire backyard from my room window, and that's when I noticed something. Marco was playing with a bunch of kids from our school. The clown was standing close to him. As he ran toward a kid to catch him, I saw the clown push him subtly, 
Rocco fell to the ground, tumbling over a small rock and broke his chin. A tooth fell to the ground and he started crying in pain. I saw it all clearly from my bedroom window. It all happened so fast that everyone thought it was just an accident. I could clearly see the clown intentionally pushing him. His parents left the party to take him to the hospital. The clown looked up at my bedroom window and smiled. It felt as if he did that to punish Marco on my behalf. At that moment I was angry and just a kid so I felt Marco deserved it. I went downstairs and saw the kids leaving. My mom was busy talking to the parents of the other kids about the accident. I was standing on our house porch alone. Suddenly, I turned to my left and my heart skipped a beat. The clown came near me and stood beside me silently. I got scared of seeing him, but he leaned in towards my face and said, I'm your friend, Jeremy. This will be our little secret. I realized he now knows that I saw him pushing Marco. And that's when my mom called me to take my gifts inside. I walked towards my mom, but as I looked back, I saw the clown was nowhere. My mom was just as confused. She said, where did the clown guy go? I couldn't even pay him. Two to three days later, I went to the park with Amanda. We were playing near the jungle gym when I heard a voice close to my back. Hello, Jeremy. You remember me? I saw the same clown standing behind me with this creepy smile. Amanda said, Hey, you came to Jeremy's birthday party. The clown smiled back and said, Yeah, and now I came to see you guys again. He gave us candies and said, How's your friend Marco? I looked at Amanda and said in a fumbling voice, He's, uh, he's fine now. The clown seemed interested in spending time with us, but suddenly my mom rushed towards us. Why don't you leave these kids alone, huh? I know what you did to poor Marco. Jeremy told me you pushed him. Listen, you freak. If you don't leave now, I'm going to call the cops on you. The clown took a few steps back. I saw his joyful smile change into a mean, evil grin. He then looked at me and said, Don't be afraid, Jeremy. I'll always be your friend. He then walked away silently. I knew my mom was pissed at him. And in the back of my mind, something told me he wasn't going to sleep on the insult. The day was the 10th of March. Yeah, I'll never forget this date. I came home from school. A man and I often walked home together. When we arrived at my house, I waved to her goodbye and walked towards my house porch. I twisted the doorknob and got inside. Usually, my mom watched TV whenever she was home taking a day off, but that day the entire ambience of the house was awfully quiet. I said, Mom, I'm home, but no reply came. I said again, Mom, where are you? I'm hungry. Still no reply. A shiver ran down my spine. A feeling surrounded me, telling something was not right with our house. I slowly walked towards the kitchen, and what I saw made my skin crawl in fear. The clown was sitting on the kitchen floor in front of a small pool of blood. He smiled at me and said, Welcome home, Jeremy. Do you want to see something funny? He then dipped his hand in the blood. While his finger dripped the blood on the floor, the guy started to literally lick them. I screamed at the top of my lungs, and the clown started to laugh. His hysterical laughter echoed in the empty house. I said, now crying at this point, Where is my mom? What did you do to her? The clown got up and said in an angry, vengeful voice, Your mom? She's not your mom. She kept you away from me all these years. I'm your dad. Jeremy, you're my son. The clown then went behind the kitchen table and started to drag something. I was out of words, completely shocked by what was happening with my life. But the ultimate horror flashed in front of my eyes as the clown dragged my mom's body. He slit her throat and she was lying on the ground lifeless, covered with blood. And the clown then looked at me and laughed. I screamed even louder this time as I couldn't believe my eyes. People in our neighborhood gathered in front of my house. The clown didn't even try to run away. He just stood there watching my dead mom with his psychotic face. The cops came and arrested him. I came to know he was indeed my actual dad, but he was in prison for some serious criminal charges, which is why my mom kept me away from him all these years. He got bailed before my birthday and came to get his son back. I was standing close to my grandma. We were in tears when the paramedics took my mom's body away. The neighborhood was watching with scared eyes when the cops took the clown away. Before getting into the car, he looked back at me and said, Remember, Jeremy, 
I'll always be your friend. I feel I'm absolutely lost now. I don't make new friends, and I don't even see my close ones. I don't know whether the clown slash my dad received capital punishment for murdering my mother, but I'm already enough messed up in trouble to ask anyone about it. My grandma sent me away to boarding school to keep me away from all this, and since then I've been running away from my past. This is an utterly disturbing story. My husband and I are both doctors. We both have pretty hectic work schedules. We have a son who is only four years old. It was difficult to raise him and manage the work at the same time. Hence, we had to rely on babysitters to keep an eye on him. He's always been a pretty active child. The area we live in can definitely be considered safe until this incident shook all of us. It happened last week, and I'm still trying to get over the trauma. My husband and I work in the same hospital, and we're both surgeons. After the pandemic and lockdown period, our work stress increased rapidly while Monty stayed home alone. So, my husband and I often kept a babysitter to watch over him. I posted an ad on a very famous social media platform. Three days after posting the ad, I received a call from a girl named Diana. Diana was a student, and she seemed very interested in the job over the phone. Without thinking much, I told her to come by and babysit on Thursday evening. The day arrived, and if I'm being honest, Diana and Monty got along really well. They started to play puzzles, and I got relieved that Monty would be in good hands. My husband and I left for the hospital. I told Diana that we would be home by 10. I also told her that we made a pasta for them, and it was in the fridge but needed to be microwaved, and that Monty's bedtime was at 8pm. Diana smiled at me and said, Sure, Mrs. Mendez. As I got in the car, I saw Monty and Diana standing at our house porch and waving me goodbye. After that day, Diana became a regular choice whenever we needed a babysitter. She became good friends with Monty, and surprisingly, Monty listened to her with full attention. I was happy to see this sudden change in Monty at first. One day, my husband was out of the station at a medical conference. I took the day off so that I could spend time with Monty. I decided to draw him a bath and then watch a cartoon movie with him. I placed him inside the bathtub, and when I went to scrub his back, I got shocked. There was a weird symbol drawn onto his shoulders with a black marker pen. I didn't understand what the symbol meant. I asked Monty what the sign was, and he just replied saying it was nothing. That was the first time I felt like my son was hiding something from me. I asked him again who did this to him, and he replied saying, Diana and I were playing. She has a tattoo like this. I wanted one too, and that's when she drew it on me. I know I should have dealt with this matter with more priority, but at that moment it appeared like a silly childish wish and nothing else. Fast forward a week later, and I was doing regular house chores. I was cleaning the window of Monty's room. I opened it to wipe the outside surface of the glass. That's when I found a cross-like figure. As I looked more closely, I noticed strands of hairs tied to it too. I didn't know where it came from. I thought maybe the window brought it here. I dumped it in the dustbin and didn't say anything to my husband. I overlooked the alarming situation that day. More time passed, and I realized all that was happening wasn't just some weird coincidence. My husband and I were sitting in the living room watching a movie, and suddenly he said, Amy, I was thinking of asking you something. I replied asking what it was, and he said, Did you notice anything strange in Monty's behavior? Until now, I was keeping that feeling to myself, but as Simon mentioned it, I immediately looked at him with worried eyes. Simon went on to say, Last night, when I went to the kitchen to get water, I heard whispering sounds coming from Monty's room. At first, I thought maybe I imagined it, so I tiptoed to his room and peeked inside. You won't believe what I saw. I immediately asked him what. I saw our son was sitting on the bed and praying. I mean, I have no issues with this sudden change, but you know, we've never been a very religious family. I wonder how he learnt all that. Simon's voice sounded confused. We were both a bit worried, but you can't just scold a child for praying, right? So we didn't confront him at that point. One night, Diana came to babysit again. I instantly asked her, Uh, Diana, if you don't mind, can I ask you something? Diana replied with the same smiling face. Sure, Mrs. Mendez, what is it? I said in a hesitant voice, Did you teach Monty to pray before bed? 
She didn't get startled by my question. With the same calm expression on her face, she said, What's wrong in praying, Mrs. Mendez? Honestly, I had no logical answer to her question, so I just dropped the topic. I mean, seriously, no harm ever came from a four-year-old kid praying before sleep, right? And days passed, and my son started to change into a completely different person. Monty stopped running around the house, or doing all those things to annoy me. Suddenly, he turned into an extremely quiet and introverted kid. And at some point, his behaviors freaked me out. For example, one afternoon, I was working in the backyard. Monty was sitting on a swing and watching the birds fly in the sky. I said in a joyful voice what a lovely day it was, and asked Monty if he thought the same. He didn't reply like he used to. I was thinking to go and play with him, when suddenly a small bird fell on the ground. I rushed towards it and picked it up. Are you hurt, the little guy? And that was when Monty said something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Monty walked close to me and looked at the bird and then said, End its pain, Mom. It should die. I was shocked hearing these cruel words from a four-year-old. I said, Monty, why would you say something like that? Who told you all these things? Suddenly, he looked at me, and I felt this was not the Monty I used to know. There was something in his eyes that spooked me that day. He smiled in a very evil way, and then went inside. I told my husband this instant, and we both came to the conclusion that Diana is leaving a bad impression on her son. So we decided to opt for a new babysitter the next time. And we finally did. The new babysitter's name was Corey. She was the daughter of our next door neighbor, so we knew her well. I said to Monty, Monty, Corey will come and watch you tonight. Your father and I will be home as soon as we can. Monty looked at me with angry eyes and said, Where's Diana? I instantly replied, She won't come here anymore. Corey's your new babysitter from now on. Monty started to argue, No, I want Diana. I lost my calm voice and scolded him saying, I told you, Diana won't come here. Now go to your room. I don't want to hear another word about Diana. Corey came, but Monty didn't come out of his room. I left for work with a disturbed mind. After being at work for a while, I came out of the emergency room. I went to my desk to call home just to check on them. I was going to dial when I received a call from Diana. Out of irritation, I picked it up and said what? Diana replied, Mrs. Mendez, I don't think the new babysitter will be able to take good care of Monty. You should probably think again. I was disgusted to see the girl's audacity. I screamed on the phone, saying Monty was my son, and then I knew what was best for him. I told her if she didn't stay away, I would take serious action. I then disconnected the phone. My husband came and asked me what happened. I told him the entire matter. Still angry, I also told him I should have kicked that freak out the day she made a weird tattoo on our son. My husband looked at me with confused eyes and said, What tattoo? I explained to him it was a star inside a circle. Simon googled something on his phone and then showed it to me saying, Is this the symbol you're talking about? It was indeed the symbol. Simon then said in a panicked voice, We should have taken this matter more seriously. Why? I replied. What does the symbol mean? We came to know that it was actually a satanic symbol that cult groups worship. All the weird behavior of my son started to make sense to me. The thought of Diana being a cult member came to me. I immediately called the house to warn Corey to not let her in if she comes. I dialed her number, but it just kept ringing. My heartbeat grew rapidly, and Simon and I rushed towards the car. We called 911 on our way home. When we reached the house, we found the house in pitch darkness. Not a single light was on. As I walked close to the main door, I heard a chanting sound coming from Monty's room. I found the door locked from the inside. Simon twisted the key and the door finally opened. The entire house stood like a set from a horror film. There was this burning smell. I noticed someone was lying on the living room couch. Simon slowly walked, and we found Corey on the couch. She was unconscious, and there was dried blood on her forehead. It was clear someone hit her with a blunt object and made her unconscious. I ran to Monty's room, and I opened the door. That's when my heart sunk in terror. His room was filled with candles. Monty was lying on Diana's lap, and she was chanting some psychotic prayers. And there was a circle made around them, and beyond all of that, she was holding a knife to my four-year-old son's throat. I screamed at her what she was doing with my son. Diana opened her eyes and started to laugh like a maniac. 
I could see Monty <laughs> woke from a sense of numbness and started to cry. Diana said in an evil voice, The Dark Lord demands your son's soul. I'm preparing him for the sacrifice. Once I submit his soul, I'll be immortal. He'll give me all the powers he has promised. I screamed in response, saying that if she hurt my son, I would kill her. Diana just laughed and rose her knife while chanting her satanic prayers. I screamed at the top of my lungs, saying no. Suddenly, my husband rushed towards her, and before she could slice Monty's throat, Simon hit her with his baseball bat hard. It all happened so quick that Diana couldn't guess it coming. She fell on the floor, and blood started to flow from the back of her. Monty got up and rushed towards me while crying and shaking in fear. We called the cops, and they came shortly after to take her into custody. Corey was admitted to the hospital as well. Diana had been shifted to a mental institution after she recovered from the head injury. And the cops came to know that she had joined a cult group. It still scares me to sleep that if we hadn't reached home in time, she would have actually sacrificed my son for some satanic ritual. Her psychotic chants still haunt me in my sleep. I grew up in a small town. My mother worked two jobs to support us financially. When I was seven years old, my dad left my mom and never came back. And my brother, unfortunately, has autism. Unlike others, he is actually a bit better in his condition. Though, he rarely talks or expresses like a normal person. But he can do his basic chores. Most of the day, he sits near the window and watches the world outside. This incident happened when I was 15 years old and my brother Jack was 11. My mom was working a night shift on a Thursday, so basically it was just me and my brother. We were kind of used to staying on our own at night, because we had no other choice. Our neighbor next door was an alcoholic man. He had a son close to my age, but we often heard the man screaming at his son late at night. This particular night, I was sitting in our living room and watching TV. My brother was upstairs, lying on his bed. Suddenly, I heard huge chaos outside. I opened the door and saw three or four people had gathered in front of our neighbor's house. Within five to seven minutes, a cop arrived. They sealed the entire house within seconds. Paramedics even came out and took a body on a stretcher. And behind them, I saw the father getting into an ambulance with a bleeding head. At first, I couldn't understand what was going on. But after hearing the conversations of the people gathering in front of the scene, it gave me a clear idea of what just happened. The father reported to 911 saying a homeless man broke into their house and tried to rob them. He hit the father with a baseball bat and badly injured him. As the father was already drunk, he fell to the floor in terrible pain. The father saw the son rushing towards the man to stop him. That was just when the man hit his son on the back of the head and he fell to the floor. The man then stole his wallet and a few electronics and escaped the premises. The cops registered the father's complaint. But after suffering a huge blood clotting inside the brain, his son died in the hospital that night. Our entire town was shook in fear. No one expected such a terrible tragedy. The father arranged a small funeral for his son, and we attended. Everyone paid their condolences to him. The local sheriff assured him that they would find the guy who destroyed his family. My mom got utterly terrified, and asked our grandma to watch us during our night shifts. Our neighbor, Mr. Feynman, had changed after his son's death. I often saw him sitting on the porch with a terrified face. I could tell that he was suffering the trauma of that night, every single second. I mean, no doubt it would have been horrifying to watch your son dying on the floor at the hands of an intruder and not being able to do anything. Mr. Feynman stopped drinking after that incident. He pleaded with the sheriff to let him move out as he was traumatized to live in that house, but the ongoing investigation compelled him to stay back. About a week after the incident, I started to notice some weird behavior in my brother. Even though we never discussed the death of the boy next door, I'm sure my brother must have realized something happened to our neighbors. One day, I was doing my schoolwork sitting in the living room. It was a boring, rainy afternoon. Jack was sitting next to the living room window and watching the raindrops. Suddenly, I heard him chuckle. I looked at him and saw he was looking outside and laughing at something. The street and neighboring houses were visible from that window. I asked him, What's so funny, Jack? He chuckled and said, Him, and pointed out the window. I immediately got up and walked towards the window. I stood next to my brother and looked out. Like I said, it was raining outside. The rain wasn't that heavy, which is why I could see the empty street clearly. As far as my eyes went, I didn't see a single living creature outside. I thought to myself, Jack was probably imagining something, and I laughed at it. That night, 
when we all sat for dinner, Jack surprised all of us. My mom served him some food and placed the plate in front of him to eat. But Jack got up and slowly went to the kitchen. He then brought an extra plate and placed it on the table right beside him. Why did you bring an extra plate? My mom said. He looked beside him as if someone was actually sitting on the chair next to him and smiled on his own. I was feeling very odd about his behavior. I said, Jack, mom is asking you something. He then looked at our mom and said, He's hungry, mom. Serve him too, he's hungry. My mom and I were absolutely stunned by Jack's behavior. My mom replied in a low, calm voice, Who is he? Jack chuckled and said, My friend, William. We just thought that like every normal kid, Jack had an imaginary friend. So that night we didn't react to his sudden weird behavior as he seemed happy, so we decided to play along with this. Jack often talked and smiled on his own. Whenever someone asked, he said he was talking to his friend William. Things never took a different turn, so Jack's behavior never worried me that way. That was until one night. I woke up in my room and heard footsteps going down the stairs. Now, my mom slept downstairs while my brother and I had a room upstairs. I got up from my bed and went to check on my brother. As I opened his bedroom door, I saw it was empty. I rushed downstairs and found the main door wide open. I freaked out and woke up my mom. We came out of the house and started calling for my brother. My mom was about to cry when we heard a chuckling sound coming from our backyard. We ran there and saw Jack standing under a tree. He was facing his back at us. I said in a broken voice, Jackie, are you alright? He suddenly turned towards us. I've never seen my brother like this. His eyes were blood red and his face was filled with pain. He said in a rough voice, He's buried here, and then fainted on the ground. My brother caught a high fever the next morning. We called many doctors, but no one could tell exactly what was wrong with him. My mom became tense and worried. She hardly slept at night. One night, I saw my mom talking to our town sheriff standing at the doorway. After the sheriff left, I asked my mom what he was saying. My mom replied that the sheriff was going to close the next door neighbor's case file. They investigated a lot but couldn't get a hold of the intruder who broke into their house that night. Suddenly, my eyes widened. I asked my mom, Uh, mom? What was the name of Mr. Feynman's son? She replied, Uh, I think it was William. Why do you ask? My head started to throb in fear. Is this possible? All this time, the imaginary friend my brother was talking about was none other than our neighbor's dead son. I rushed to Jack's room. He was muttering something in his sleep. I got close to him and said, Jack, Jack, is William right here with you now? You're just gonna have to trust me, I am not making this up at all. My brother suddenly opened his eyes and looked at the corner of the room. As I followed his eyes, my heart sunk in fear. A teenage boy was standing in the darkness of the corner of the room. His eyes were pale white with small pupils gushing out of them. His face was particularly visible as his entire body was in the darkness. Dried blood spots were visible on his left cheek and forehead. He then looked at me and my brother. Jackie got out of his bed slowly. He then started to walk out of the room. I followed him downstairs. My mom was sitting in the living room. Suddenly seeing Jack walking on his own amidst this fever, she rushed to him. But before she could do anything else, I stopped her and told her everything. My mom and I came out of the house following Jack. Jack walked towards the backyard and stopped right in front of the tree. This tree was standing in the middle of our backyard and the backyard of our neighbor, Mr. Feynman. Jack then pointed towards the ground beneath the tree and said, Dig here. And then fainted to the ground. Without wasting a single second, I told my mom to call our sheriff. And she did right away. He came with three other police officers. People in our neighborhood gathered in our backyard out of curiosity. In front of everyone, the cops dug under the tree. And what they found still disturbs me to this day. They found a bloody baseball bat wrapped in a bloody cloth buried under the tree. And the mystery unfolded. Shocking our town once again, Mr. Feynman murdered his own son out of a feat of drunkenness. But to save himself from the law, he decided to make up the entire story of the robbery. He injured himself, willing to make the situation more believable, and even secretly buried the murder weapon. Without the murder weapon, no cops would have ever caught this man. That must have been why he wanted to move out so bad. The cops arrested him that day and took him into custody. Surprisingly, my brother Jack got completely better the very next day. We still live in that house, and I believe William has finally been able to rest in peace. I am Samuel, and this is not exactly my story, but unfortunately, 
I ended up being a part of it. A few months back, I went on a hiking trip in Bloomington, Indiana with my three friends, Betty, Jason, and Molly. We studied in the same high school and often met each other during the holidays. There is a park in Bloomington named McCormick's Creek State Park. The park is the oldest park in the state of Indiana. There is a magnificent waterfall, many caves, and deep woods, making the park an ideal spot for campers. We visited the waterfall and clicked some pictures in front of it. The location was amazing. Half the time of the day, we went wandering around. After walking for a long time, we decided to rest for a while and then look for a spot to camp for the night. Betty sat down on a big rock and said, Loving this place. We agreed with her. Jason started to record videos on his phone while I took out a sandwich from my backpack to eat. The birds were chirping around us. I could hear the sound of splashing water coming from the waterfall in the distance. Molly and Betty were sitting close to me and laughing. I was enjoying the view when suddenly I heard Jason's voice. Whoa, what the hell is this? Molly got up and asked, What? What happened, Jason? We saw Jason standing behind a bush and watching something. He said in a loud voice, Come, see for yourself. We got up and went towards his direction. As soon as I reached the near bush, the hair at the back of my neck stood up. There was a medium-sized animal skull lying on the ground. It seemed like a deer or something of that sort. It had horns and a bad smell as well. The weird part was the lower jaw of the skull was missing. There was only the upper side, which made it look like a huge spooky mask. We all kept staring at it with surprised eyes. How long has this thing been here? Jason said. Betty replied, well, some animal might have died and left it here. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh at her sarcasm. Jason replied in an irritating voice. I know that. Jason got down and went to touch it, but something really unexpected happened. As he stretched his hand towards the skull, the skull suddenly moved away. Oh my God, did it move on its own? Betty said with shocking eyes. We were all equally shocked to witness this incident. I said, uh, well, there could be a rat or a small animal underneath it. Betty replied, ew, there could be maggots too. Whatever it is, I don't want to be near this shit. Molly said, come on guys, let's go and camp for the night. This is just a stupid skull of a dead animal and it's creeping me out too. Honestly, the skull made me uncomfortable too. There was something about it that didn't feel right. We all took our backpacks and started to walk away. But as I turned back, I saw Jason was still standing there and watching it, without even blinking for even a second. I said in a loud voice, Jason, come on, we gotta go. He said hesitantly, yeah, coming. We walked for another 15 minutes and chose a favorable site for camping. Everyone got busy arranging their tents. But Jason sat down on the ground and kept looking at the horizon. He became awfully quiet all of a sudden. I sat beside him and handed him a beer. He took the beer and then said in a confused tone, you did see the skull move on its own. Right, Sam? I said, come on, Jason. You're still thinking about that skull? We came here to have some fun. Let it be, man. The sun started to set and darkness took over. I arranged some wood and lit a fire for our barbecue. Molly brought some marinated chicken. Using a stick, we started to roast it in the fire. We were drinking beer and enjoying the silence around us. The crackling sound of the fire, mixed with the crickets, made for a spooky ambiance. Suddenly, we came to realize that Jason is nowhere to be seen. Betty said, um, where is Jason? I told her that he was sitting on the rock a few moments back. Molly got up and said in a tensed voice, Where did he go then? We should look for him. I tried to call his cell phone, but there was no network in that area. We already set the camp up, and leaving all of our stuff would not have been a smart move. So I told Betty, Why don't you stay here in case Jason comes back? 
Meanwhile, Molly and I will go look for him. Betty agreed, and we started to search for Jason. Jason! Molly shouted, but no reply came back. The park was in complete darkness. We were using our flashlights to make our way. The pale moonlight created an environment of light and shadow. Every time I stepped in the rusty leaves, I felt like someone was watching me. I don't know why I felt that way, because I didn't see anyone around. Where the hell did he go, Sam? Molly asked in a tiring voice. I said in a worried voice, I don't know. He seemed disturbed from the moment he discovered that animal skull. It will be hard to find him in this darkness because... But, before I could finish my sentence, a terrifying scream took place. Molly said in a panicked voice, Isn't that Betty? Without wasting a single second, we started to run towards the campsite. I knew Betty was in trouble. The scream I just heard was nothing but a cry for help. We were running like madmen. Bushy leaves and wild trees pierced our skins as we ran through them. It took us five to seven minutes to reach the campsite. But as soon as we did, the blood in our veins turned into ice. Betty was lying on the ground near the campfire. Her eyes were wide open and still. There was blood all over her body. And she had no arms. Yes, Betty's arms were missing as if someone ripped her arms like a broken twig. Molly screamed at the top of her lungs witnessing this vicious sight. I didn't know what to do at that moment, because I've never seen a death like that. But before we could even make up our minds and take control of the situation, the ultimate horror took place. We heard a sound of munching coming from behind a tent nearby. I picked up a wooden branch from the ground, because I knew that the creature that killed our friend is still among us. I told Molly to keep quiet, and we slowly tiptoed towards the tent nearby. As we peeked behind it, my stomach dropped. A horrifying creature was chewing flesh of a human arm. It goes without saying, those were Betty's arms. The creature was sitting on his legs like a human figure. Due to the darkness around him, it was hard to see it clearly. But the way he was chewing and feeding on that human flesh it scared the shit out of me. Molly couldn't hold it anymore and started to vomit on the ground. The creature immediately turned at us and my flashlight fell on his face. What I saw, I will never be able to forget. It was a human-like figure, but instead of a human face, it had an animal skull. The same skull we saw in the afternoon while hiking near the waterfall. The skull covered half of its face, but I could still see its bloody, vicious mouth. There were thousands of sharp teeth coming out of it. Blood was dripping from it. The creature got up and made a spine-chilling growl. We took steps back, but I knew our end was near. There's no way Molly and I can defeat this hound from hell. Its bony, pigmented skin made me nauseous. Its sharp claws with long nails were enough to slice my throat off in a wink. I prayed to God to save us from this thing. The creature kept growling and taking small steps towards us. Its nature was just like a predator. It crouched on the ground in an attempt to make its final jump. We were so scared and shocked at that moment that we forgot to run. We knew it was going to hurl on us, and no one will ever know what happened to four young boys and girls who came for camping. I was sure this same creature killed our friend Jason too, when suddenly my eyes went to the left arm of this creature. My friend Jason had a tattoo of an anchor on his left arm, and this evil demon standing right in front of me had the same tattoo on his left arm, too. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Oh my god, Jason, is this you? What happened to you? Why are you trying to kill your own friends? Jason laughed in his demonic voice and said, <laughs> I'm hungry. So hungry, I need to feed. He then jumped on me and pierced his claw into my stomach. I screamed in pain and said, Run! Molly, run! But suddenly, out of nowhere, a group of four or five men came out in front of us. They were dressed in spacesuit-like costume. None of their faces were visible. They pointed a laser gun and fired at Jason. 
Making a last and final growl, Jason's body fell lifelessly on the ground. As soon as he fell on the ground, the animal's skull came off his head on its own. Those men nursed my wound. Molly was lying unconscious on the ground. They took the skull inside a closed box. I said in a painful voice, Who are you all? What happened to my friend? What is this animal skull? They didn't reply to me. They started to walk away after taking the skull with them. Except one guy turned towards me and said, We have called the cops. They will be at your rescue. He then turned towards another member of his crew and said, Call General and tell him we have successfully managed to capture SCP-323. Tell him to keep the cell ready for its containment. I don't know who they were and what happened to my friend, but we told the cops how an animal attack changed our lives into a living nightmare. I still have so many unanswered questions that keep me awake at night. Me and my family just recently moved to our new house. My dad bought it in an auction. The house was actually better than any of the previous ones we had lived in. It had a big pool in the backside, and a small garden beside the pool too. There was a big tree in the garden which grew scented yellow flowers. The backside is probably the only reason why I agreed to move into the house. The house was also close to my school, hence my parents were happy about the safety measures. Both of my parents traveled a lot, so I got accustomed to staying alone in the house from quite a young age. We had tight securities and alarms all around this new house too. There was no way anyone could break in without setting off the alarm, so I had nothing to worry about. At the back of the house, there stood an old three-story apartment. I would always see people on the first and second floor, but the third floor, it felt like no one stayed there. The third story's bedroom windows faced directly at the back side of our house. It was a calm and quiet place, so I kind of liked chilling in my house while my parents were on tour. One weekend, my parents were off to visit my sick aunt in LA. I stayed back home like usual. It was a Saturday night, and all my friends wanted to hang out at one of my other friend's house. I promised my parents not to stay out late, so after a couple of beers, I came back home. It was 9pm, and I wasn't feeling sleepy at all. I went upstairs and got in my bathing suit to go for a swim in the pool. It was a hot summer night. I poured myself a glass of fresh orange juice and put on some music. I swam for some time, and then I drank my juice lying on my pool raft. I must have fallen asleep. I heard a noise and I woke up. The back side of the apartment was all empty. No one was around. Just then, my eyes went to the third floor window of the nearby building. A frail old woman was standing in front of the window looking directly at me. Her eyes were so big that her stare kind of freaked me out. I didn't say anything and looked at my watch. It was around 10 p.m. I just continued to lie on my raft, thinking she would leave on her own. After a couple of minutes, when I looked back, she wasn't there on the window. I felt relieved and kept thinking how come I never saw her before. I almost thought that no one lived on the third floor apartment. That's when I heard my phone ringing. It was inside the house, so I got up out of the pool thinking it was my parents calling. I was just about to step inside when I heard a voice coming from behind me. I froze. It was an old woman's voice. I slowly turned back and my heart drowned in horror. That old, creepy woman was standing right behind me. There was no way she could have gotten in my backyard without breaking in. Her wide, cold death stare made my legs numb. I literally couldn't walk away, even though I wanted to so badly. I spoke in a broken voice. Ma'am? How did you... how did you get inside? She slightly opened her toothless mouth and said, Isabel, you're still here? Run away now or your husband will come and bury you there. She then lifted her weak, lean hand and pointed towards the tree in our garden with her long, creepy fingers. My blood turned to ice. I replied in a shaky voice, well, What are you saying? She didn't answer. She just kept staring at the tree and then back to my face. Her mouth opened and her eyes widened. It was such a horrible sight. Suddenly, my phone again rang and I ran towards my room frantically this time. I got inside my room and locked it. It was my dad. I answered the phone and stood sobbing terribly. My dad got all freaked out and called 911 on my behalf. The cops came after 10 minutes, and I told them an old crazy lady from the nearby apartment entered our backyard and said some very bizarre things to me. 
They immediately went to the apartment building and asked the landlord about his tenants on the third floor. It came out as a shock when the landlord said that that floor of the apartment had been empty for the last 15 years. But he also said that an old lady used to live on that floor way back in the day. She was sick and bedridden, so she spent most of her time sitting near that window inside the dark room, and that her children left her alone during her last days. And she even died sitting near that window. The landlord himself did her cremation rituals. The next morning, when my parents came, I told them everything, and a lady cop also stood back with me in the house from last night. She also explained to my parents that I might have just had a bad dream or something, but while they were talking, something popped into my mind. I asked my dad what was the name of the previous owner of our house. He replied, saying the bank told him a woman lived here with her husband in the house before we moved in. But he also added that that was 15 years ago, and he asked why I was asking. My heart started to beat faster. I told the cop that the old woman addressed me as Isabel, and said her husband buried her under that tree. They both looked pretty surprised, and the cop even decided to check our backyard. When they dug under the tree, scaring the hell out of everyone, a skeleton of a full-grown woman got discovered from our garden. It had a ring on its left hand. Me, along with my mom and my dad, were all completely paranoid. We never knew that there was a dead body lying in our garden. The cops investigated this matter, and they came to know that indeed it was a woman named Isabel's remains. Her husband filed a missing persons report, but after filing the report, he too left the house and the town. Due to the lack of evidence, the police couldn't find any details about her. Also, no one came to interrogate him about her. Her autopsy report signified that she was murdered by a serious injury made by a blunt object on the back of the head. The cops instantly suspected it was her husband who murdered her and had buried her under that tree. And to this day, they're still searching for her husband. I am almost positive that that old lady saw this entire incident from her room's window, but couldn't tell anyone. Even though people find it hard to believe, I think she came back to tell me about it, and I believe it was her ghost that I saw that night. But the question that kept eating my mind was, why me? But this too got answered when the cops published Isabel's picture in the local newspaper, stating about the gruesome case. My parents are still in deep shock. I have no idea what to say. Isabel looks exactly like me, or should I say I look exactly like her. We're still living in the same house to this day, but I haven't seen that old lady ever again. My name's Peter, and this is the most haunting memory of my life. This incident happened when I was 12 years old. My father had transferable jobs, so we often switch houses. One time, we were staying in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The company gave us an old house to stay in. It was morning, and I was helping my mom unpack our things. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. My father was at work, it was just the two of us in the house. I rushed to the door and opened it. I saw an old woman standing on our house porch. She smiled back at me and said, Is your mother home? I called my mom, and they started to chat. I came to know that this old woman was our next door neighbor. Apparently, she was also a valuable member of the town council. She invited our family for the annual township parade and fireworks on the coming Saturday. My mom happily accepted the invitation, and the old woman left. That night, when my dad came home, my mom told him all about it. Even though my parents were excited to go there, I on the other hand knew I would be bored. Being a kid is not easy, and I hate it every time we move to a new area. Anyways, we all got dressed up and left for the township annual parade. The celebration took place in a huge local park. Town people greeted us, and the old woman got busy introducing my parents to all the council members. I grabbed an ice cream from a truck nearby and sat down on a wooden bench. A group of seven to eight people were marching in the entire park wearing different kinds of funky costumes. Everyone was having a good time. The fireworks started, and I got busy watching them. I don't know how long I sat like that, but suddenly, a sound broke my concentration. I heard a faint sobbing sound nearby. My eyes wandered around the park for three to four seconds, and that's when I saw it. Under a tree to my left, I saw a really tall figure standing in the dark. It was a man, but I couldn't see his face clearly. The only thing that caught my attention was his weird-looking shoes. 
I was trying to figure out the entire situation when the tall man came out from the dark. It was a man dressed in a clown costume. His attire explained why he was wearing those funky shoes. As I was looking at him, this sense of discomfort came over me. Unlike other normal clowns, he looked completely different. Tears were rolling down his eyes, messing up his creepily painted face. His face was extremely sad. He was just standing there and watching me. I don't know what it was about his stare, but I couldn't move an inch. It felt like someone had glued me to the bench. I don't know how long I sat there, but it felt like forever. The man wasn't blinking. He wasn't even moving. He just stood there with a terrifyingly sad face and watched me. Suddenly, a huge firework burst above my head, and I got my senses back. I looked up for a second, and again looked at the tree. But he was gone. That night after coming home, I didn't sleep well. I even had a terrible dream. In my dream, I saw myself standing alone in that park. The park was empty and awfully quiet. There wasn't any sound around me. But all of a sudden, I heard a <laughs> sobbing sound. I turned over and saw the sad clown standing near the park blocking my way. He was whispering uncomfortably. After whimpering like that for a while, the clown finally said, I want to smile. Can you put a smile on my face? He then took out a shiny knife from his pocket and started to cut his mouth to a great smile. I could hear the sound of flesh tearing. The more he cut himself, the louder his whimpering grew. I turned back to run and fell on the ground. That's when I woke up in my bed, covered in sweat. I didn't tell my parents about this because I already knew they wouldn't believe me. A few days went by and I almost forgot about this clown. I went to my local school. I met a girl named Sarah who lived close to my house. She was kind to me the very first day, and we became good friends in no time. Sarah and I often walked home together after school. One day, we were walking down the road when she started talking about the history of the town. She talked about the annual parade thing, and that's when that scary clown flashed in my memory. I said in a hesitant voice, Um, yeah, I was there that night, but the clown of the parade seemed really weird to me. Sarah looked at me with surprised eyes and said, What clown? I replied, Well, there was this clown that irritated me by making a sad face and then suddenly disappeared. Sarah didn't let me finish. She said, Are you sure it was a clown? I nodded my head. Yeah, everyone knows what a clown looks like. Sarah said in a low but serious voice, We're in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We don't have clowns anymore. It's kind of forbidden here. Everyone believes clowns to be a bad omen after 2016. I said in a confused voice, what happened in 2016? Sarah told me how criminals terrified this area dressed in clown costumes, and how people were scared to go out. Everyone's life turned miserable due to these killer clowns until cops caught them, and even shot some of them, all to put a stop to it. Sarah also said that the town people believed that the spirits of those dead clowns still haunt the area. The sun was about to set, and the sky turned dark. We realized it was getting late, and there was no one in the streets. Sarah waved me goodbye, and then went towards her house on the right, though my house was still a 10 minute walk away. I started to walk faster, as her story spooked me a bit. The memory of that terrifying dream again grabbed my mind. I have no shame in saying that I was insanely scared in that moment. I decided to take the shortcut through the park. The park was completely empty, and I began walking through it. After taking a few steps, a sense of fear grabbed my heart. I felt as if someone was watching me. Looking back over my shoulder, I saw the most spine-chilling sight. That sad clown from my dream was standing at the entrance of the park. Even though there was darkness around, I could still see his terrifying face. I tried to tell myself it was all just in my imagination, and I turned and started to walk even faster. But suddenly, a rapid sound of footsteps started to appear behind me. As I looked behind me in reaction, I saw the clown running towards me at full speed. His arms were widely stretched, his face was dripping with tears of blood, and the way he was staring at me freaked me out. For a moment, I thought if he caught me, he would kill me without any hesitation. But I screamed at the top of my lungs and started to run towards my house. I didn't look back, I didn't stop, and I just kept running for my life. I don't remember exactly what happened in the end, but my mom told me she heard a loud bang on the door and my scream. As she opened the door, she found me unconscious on her porch. A high fever took over, and I got bedridden for a week. My mom told me I often mummed in my sleep, about if someone caught me that I'd get killed. 
My mom still doesn't know what exactly happened to her son that day. My dad changed his job, and we took a house near our grandparents. I never went back to that town, and since then, I stay the hell away from clowns. Sometimes, I even get nightmares of seeing myself running on an empty road, even though no one's chasing me. And all of a sudden, that sad clown would appear in front of me. Yesterday, I went to the police station. The cops called me to inquire about a recent horrifying incident. Accidentally, I got involved in this without causing any harm to anyone. It all started last week. I met a guy named Patrick on Omegle. After a couple of interactions, we became quite comfortable. Patrick sent me a friend request on Facebook. I accepted immediately. After talking online for a week, we finally decided to go on a date. He shared with me the address of a local pub. We had a nice time together. I got a bit drunk, but Patrick safely dropped me home. Patrick was an average height guy. He was caring. Within a few days, he started to give me signals that he likes me more than a friend. But as I just met him and also wasn't looking for a relationship then, I decided to confront him before things got out of hand. One evening, I was sitting in my bedroom and video calling Patrick. After sharing a laugh or two, I told Patrick that he's a really good friend and I would like to keep things slow between us. So far, I never saw Patrick become angry. I mean, he's that kind of guy who is used to smiling all the time. But as I told him this, I saw his expression change. He suddenly became very upset and disconnected the call without saying a single word. Three days went by, but Patrick didn't call or text me. I called him many times, but he never picked up. It was a Thursday evening. I was coming home from the gym. I was walking down the sidewalk. The streets were empty and dark. Suddenly, my eyes went to the left side of the road. There was a street lamp on the left. I saw a man standing behind the street lamp. At first, I got a bit spooked, but as the man came to me, I heaved a sigh of relief. It was none other than Patrick. Patrick came and stood in front of me. His face seemed very different this time. There were dark circles around his eyes. He looked sick to me. I said in a surprising voice, Patrick, what happened to you? Are you all right? Patrick smiled in a fake way and said, uh, I am sorry I couldn't get back to you. I was uh, down with a fever. I said in a hesitant voice, Why didn't you call me then? I would have come to see you. Patrick smiled again and said, Can I walk you home? I nodded my head and we started walking together. For the first few seconds, none of us talked. Suddenly, Patrick said, Why don't you like me, Jenny? I have always been nice to you. I said in a calm voice, I do like you, Patrick. It's just, I'm not looking for a relationship right now. Please try to understand. I think we will be better off friends. Patrick again became quiet. I had no intention to be rude to him, but the way he was behaving, I had to be straightforward. We were almost near my house. All this time, I didn't care much, but suddenly a question came to mind. I never shared my gym address or schedule with Patrick. I stopped and asked him, how did you know where to find me? Patrick smiled and said, Remember the cafe where we met last time? I said, yeah. Patrick replied, When you went to the washroom, I casually checked your phone. There I saw your weekly calendars and found out about this gym thing. I was stunned to see his audacity. Not only did he say all these creepy things in a calm voice, but also took pride in it. Finally, I lost my mind. I said in a loud voice, I never thought you were a creep, Patrick. You better stay the hell away from me. I walked away. I didn't bother to look back at Patrick. That night, I received many calls and texts from him, but chose to ignore him completely. A few more days went by. One morning, I was sitting on the house porch and drinking coffee when a delivery guy came. He handed me a big package and left. As I opened the package, my stomach dropped. My skin started to crawl. There was a jar filled with a thick reddish liquid. As I opened the lid of the jar, a salty, reeking smell filled my nose. I was feeling like throwing up at that moment. Suddenly, my phone rang, and it was Patrick. I picked up the phone with furious anger. What the hell is wrong with you? I screamed. <laughs> Patrick laughed as if nothing happened, then said, Don't worry, Jeannie. It's just pig's blood, not mine. I would be dead if I had to send that amount of blood to you. 
I was out of my mind. Is he trying to threaten me now? I said, listen you freak, don't you dare try to threaten me. Cowards like you can only make fake threats, that's all. I disconnected the phone and blocked him from everywhere. That night, around 1 a.m., I received a call from my friend Tina. As I picked up, Tina said in a panicked voice, Jenny, do you know a guy named Patrick? I never shared about Patrick with any of my close friends. I almost got up in a rush and said, Yes, uh, I met him in Omegle. But how do you know about him? I never told anyone about him. Tina took a small pause and said, There's a video that has gone viral. People are now sharing it. It's a screen recording of a video call from an Omegle chat. I think you should look at it at once. I replied, But why? What happened? Tina cut the call and within a few seconds, she sent me a video. As I opened the video, I saw it was indeed a screen recording of an Omegle video chat. Patrick was sitting on the other side of the screen. The man or woman who recorded this obviously had no idea what was going to happen next. In the next two to three minutes, Patrick talked normally. I could hear his voice clearly. Then he said suddenly, thank you for recording my message. I hope it reaches Jenny. Don't know what the other person said, but Patrick smiled. He then again said, Jenny, if you find this video, I want to prove to you how much you actually mean to me. This is why I'm going to commit suicide in love, camera. Oh my God, this guy is crazy. I never expected Patrick would go insane over such a small issue. He took a sharp knife and placed it on his neck. He then looked at the camera for one last time. His eyes were so vivid that it felt like he was looking right into my eyes. He then said in a spine chilling, calm voice, I love you and I am no coward, Jenny. In front of a live chat, Patrick sliced his own throat. Blood came gushing out of his cut throat. He started to choke on his own blood, making horrible sounds. The video went viral like wildfire. The cops had to intervene in this matter and called me to give a statement about this entire situation. They managed to trace our call logs and messages. The text made things very clear that I never gave any wrong signal to Patrick. It is not my fault that the poor guy took his life. My parents came from Florida and now stay with me. But no matter how much they console me saying it wasn't my fault, deep down inside, I still feel calling him cowardly that day triggered the suicidal tendencies in him. I can't sleep, I can't eat, I'm so scared to meet people. What do you think? Am I really the reason for Patrick's death? Do you believe in ghosts? Because I do. Let me share this one terrifying incident of my life, and you will know why I asked you the following question. My parents used to pamper me a lot. There was hardly any situation when I asked for something that they didn't make it happen. I liked playing with toys and dolls. On my sixth birthday, my dad bought me a ventriloquist dummy from the town fair. The dummy was almost the size of a toddler. It had a pale white face with round, popped out eyes. Even though my mom wasn't excited about this new toy, my dad persuaded her into buying it for me. The dummy wore a tuxedo with a red bow on its neck. I started to grow fonder of this new toy and I named him Spikey. One night, my mom called me to come for dinner. My room was upstairs while my parents slept downstairs. I started to take Spikey everywhere I went. That night, as I sat for dinner, I placed Spikey right beside me. My mom said, Jim, don't bring your toys to the dinner table. Go keep it in your room. My dad replied, Come on, Lily, let the kid be. What's wrong if he loves his doll? I still remember what my mom replied. She said in an uncomfortable voice, The way this dummy stares at me, it creeps me out. There were plenty of toys at that fair. Why on earth did you bring this one home, Robert? My dad never took such comments seriously, so he laughed hearing my mom complaining about a stupid doll. I, on the other hand, never felt weird about Spikey. We stayed in a quiet neighborhood and I was never good at making friends particularly at that age. My dad worked in a law firm, hence he remained very busy throughout the week. My mom, on the other hand, applied for a job at Walmart. One day I came home from school and heard my mom's joyful voice inside the house. After hearing for a few seconds, I realized she was talking to my Nana. 
I am so excited to finally get this job, Mom. Yeah, Robert and I have decided to keep a babysitter to watch over Jim. Mom, I'm home, I said in a loud voice. She hung up the phone and came to hug me. I realized that she was happy with the job. That night, she cooked my favorite dinner. While tucking me to bed, my mom said, Jim, your father and I will be working late tomorrow. I've called Sophie and she will be with you until we come back. I want you to behave and listen to her, okay? I replied, Okay, Mom. She kissed me on my forehead and I went to sleep. The next day, my dad left for work while dropping me off at school. Sophie was our neighbor's daughter. After a fun day at school, my mom took me home. She handed me sandwiches to eat. I was eating in the dining room when our doorbell rang. My mom opened the door and said, Hi, Sophie. Come on in. I've given sandwiches to Jim. His dinner is in the fridge and I've cooked something for you too. Don't forget to microwave it before eating. You two have fun. I'll be home by nine. My mom left for work. Sophie sat down on the couch and started watching TV. After finishing my meal, I went to her and said, Sophie, would you like to play hide and seek with me? She rolled her eyes and said, Don't you have toys to play with? Go in your room and do something on your own. Don't disturb me. I got sad and went to my room. I heard Sophie getting busy on the phone with her friend. I sat in my room quietly and then suddenly felt something standing behind me. As I turned around, I saw Spikey was sitting behind me, looking at me. Right at that moment, I felt Mom was right. Spikey does have a lively stare. I whispered, Spikey, would you like to play hide and seek with me? And then laughed. I placed Spikey turning his face towards the wall, and I went to hide. After ten minutes, I got bored and realized I can't play hide and seek with a doll. I went to hide inside my mom's closet. As I opened the closet door and came out, my eyes widened in shock. Spikey was sitting on my mom's bed, looking directly at me. This time, his face felt different to me. I could see a creepy smile on his face. I rushed towards Sophie, who was dozing off on the couch. Sophie, wake up! I said. Wh what happened? She said in a confused voice. Spikey's real now, he's scaring me! I replied in a sobbing tone. Sophie replied in an irritated voice. What? What are you talking about? I swear, I'm not lying! He's sitting on my mom's bed! I replied. Sophie got up and went to my parents' bedroom. She took Spikey on her hand and said, Okay, I get it. You want me to play hide and seek with you? Fine, let's play. Sophie faced towards the wall and started counting. I said in a nervous voice, But Sophie, I, I saw him. She looked at me and said, Do you want to play or not? Honestly, I really wanted to play hide and seek at that moment. So, without saying anything further, I went to hide upstairs. I got under my bed and waited for Sophie. I heard her voice downstairs. Ready or not, here I come. I don't remember how long I hid under the bed. The house got extremely quiet. I waited for Sophie to come upstairs, but never heard her footsteps. After some time, I came out of my room. I went downstairs and found the living room in complete darkness. I called out. Sophie? Sophie, where are you? You were supposed to find me? No reply came. I said it again. Sophie, stop it now! You're scaring me! Just then, I heard running footsteps in my mom's room and a spine-chilling scream. I rushed to the room and opened the door. Fear ran down my spine. Sophie was lying on the floor with her mouth open, and Spikey was sitting over her while stabbing her deep with her sharp kitchen knife. A whimpering sound came out of my mouth, and Spikey turned its face towards me. It was someone else. Spikey was smiling, showing his razor-sharp teeth. My doll wasn't just a doll anymore. Bloodstains were splattered all over the wall. Sophie choked for a while, and then silenced forever. I screamed and started to run towards the main door. I heard footsteps behind me. Turning back, I saw Spikey was chasing me with a sharp kitchen knife. I screamed once again, and I was close to the main door when he grabbed my feet and I fell on the hard wooden floor. 
My head started to feel heavy. Everything started to blur in front of my eyes. I saw Spikey coming at me with a sharp knife and laughing like a maniac. I couldn't take it anymore, and I passed out on the floor. When I woke up, I found myself lying on my bed. The sound of cop cars numbed my ears. Mom? Mom? I said in a feeble voice. My mom rushed towards me. Oh, my baby! Jim, I am so sorry. She then started to cry. My dad kissed my forehead and said, Take a rest, son. The conclusion of the story is told to me by my parents. When my parents came home, they found the main door half open. They found me unconscious on the floor with a bump on my forehead. Needless to say, they found Sophie's bloody corpse in their room. The cops came and everyone assumed someone broke into our house and killed the babysitter and knocked me unconscious. The only logic that no one could find is why. Why someone did all this because nothing was stolen from our house. A few days later, when I started to feel better, my dad asked me, Jim, where's your doll, Spikey? My face turned pale in fear. I knew no one would believe me, so I said, I don't know, Dad. Till today, my parents find it really weird that the intruder took nothing except my stupid ventriloquist dummy, but I know he's escaped and now roaming free. I'm 27 years old now, staying in an apartment in California. Every night before going to bed, I check my room and lock my windows. The last thing I would like to see is Spikey standing next to my bed with that bloody kitchen knife and saying, Wanna play hide and seek, Jim? Eddie moved into their new house with his parents. He was extremely excited. This house is way bigger than their previous apartment. It even has a big lake at the back of the house. He liked playing near the lake in the afternoons on holidays. Though his mom told him not to go to the lake alone, Eddie never listened. People hardly go to this lake. Maybe that's why it appears so attractive to Eddie. He sits on the bank of the lake and dangles his feet into the still, cold water. The water reflects everything like a mirror. Eddie looks at the water and makes faces and ends up laughing on his own. Long trees surround the lake. With the slow wind passing by, Eddie could see those trees moving as if they were dancing. Every holiday afternoon, Eddie secretly sneaks out of the house and comes here. One Sunday, Eddie was standing near the lake and skipping stones into the water. Suddenly, he saw something in the middle of the lake. He tried to look more closely, and what he saw shocked him. There was a hand floating on the lake. The hand wasn't moving, just floating still. Eddie asked in a surprised voice, Hey, do you need help? The hand didn't move. Eddie asked again, Hello? Can you hear me? The hand went underwater and disappeared. A thought came to his mind. What if someone is drowning? Eddie ran to the house to call his dad. He bolted inside the house, slamming the door so hard that his mom screamed. Ed, is that you? Is everything okay? Eddie said in a panicked voice, Dad, a man is drowning in the lake. Eddie's dad was watching TV, sitting on the couch. He got up and said, What? What are you saying? Eddie went to him and started pulling his hand. Yes, come on! You have to save him! He called me for help! Eddie and his dad ran to the lake, but by the time they reached the lake, there was no one to be found. The lake water was still, and the slow wind was passing by. Eddie searched with his curious eyes but he didn't see anyone or that mysterious hand. His dad scolded him for coming to the lake alone and making up stories. They went back to the house and Eddie went to his room with an angry face. He remembers seeing the hand. The entire night, Eddie couldn't sleep. He had a dream that he was standing near the lake and the hand was calling him. The next morning he woke up. He heard the sound of cop cars near their house. He rushed downstairs. He saw Mrs. Mullins crying on their doorstep, and his mother was consoling her. A cop was asking her questions, and the other two cops were patrolling the area around the house. 
Eddie couldn't understand what was going on. He asked his dad, Dad, what happened? Why is Mrs. Mullins crying? Eddie's dad took him to the living room and said in a low voice, Ed, you can't sneak out of the house anymore. Our gardener, Mr. Mullins, has gone missing since yesterday. The cops are saying someone abducted him. We all need to be very careful. Eddie said in a loud voice, That hand, Dad! I saw the hand of the lake! A cop heard him and came to him. He asked Eddie, What are you saying? Eddie's father explained how Eddie came home yesterday and said he saw someone drowning in the lake, but they checked the lake and there was no one. The cops went to search the lake, but it was so deep that they couldn't. They interrogated people in that area, but no one could claim they saw Mr. Mullins going to the lake. A week passed by and Eddie didn't go to the lake. One Sunday afternoon, his dad was away from home. It was just Eddie and his mother in the house. Eddie peeked into his mother's room and saw her sleeping. He then slowly opened the main door and tiptoed out of the house. After shutting the door behind him, he ran towards the lake. The lake stood like a mirror. He went close to the water and started searching. He said in a worried voice, Is there anyone here? Suddenly, he saw a movement in the water. Eddie got close to the water to look properly. His feet got submerged in the water. He asked, Who are you? Why aren't you coming out of the water? But before he could even get his answers, something very unexpected happened. He saw two burning pairs of eyes emerge from the water, looking at him. The eyes were so big that Eddie froze in fear. The eyes slowly started to get close to Eddie. When it was three to four hands distance from him, Eddie saw the lake water rise like a huge wave. The water was churning like a tsunami. As the creature came out, Eddie couldn't believe his eyes. The gigantic monster came out of the water. It was so huge that Eddie felt like an ant in front of it. It growled like a demon from hell and opened its huge mouth full of sharp teeth. Eddie fell on the riverbank, hitting his head on the mud. He tried to scream, but the monster was just about to devour him. Suddenly, his eyes went to a small thing from the monster's mouth. It was a sliced hand. God, it means this giant ate Mr. Mullins. Eddie couldn't breathe. From the shock and fear of this incident, he felt like he was going to die, and this creature was going to drag him into the deep, dark bottom of the lake. Eddie was falling unconscious, just when he felt someone grab him and pull him out of the lake vigorously. He saw with his blurry vision that his mom was panting and crying. Then everything went black. Eddie woke up with a high fever after two days. The doctors told him to rest completely. His parents left the house after one week. On the day that Eddie was leaving his house with his parents, he went to the lake for a few seconds. There was no one there, but suddenly, when he turned around to leave, he saw two people walking away by the riverbank. They were dressed in a funky manner, more like astronauts. Eddie heard them saying, SCP-1128 has now moved to the main ocean. We have got to capture it before it takes any more innocent lives. Suddenly, Eddie's father called him from the car. Come on, Ed, it's getting late. Eddie ran towards the car and left the lake house forever. But every night, he sees nightmares of the giant sea monster roaming in oceans and devouring everything with its sharp, vigorous teeth. When I was in junior high, I met a girl named Sandra. Sandra joined our school in the middle of the term. She was an awfully quiet and shy girl. She used to sit in the last bench of the class, hiding her face behind notebooks. I kind of felt bad for her, so one day I decided to interact with her. I went to her table during lunch, as she was eating alone. I said in a polite voice, Hi, I'm Riley. Can I join you? She was stunned to see someone finally talking to her in school. She looked at me with her tired eyes and said, Um, sure. Go ahead and sit down. The more I talked to her, the more I realized she was just any other normal cheerful girl. But she would sometimes get lost in her own thoughts. 
We eventually became friends, and we often hung out together in school. One day, Sandra came to our school with puffy, sleepless eyes. She was looking very sick, and I asked her, Hey, are you okay? I saw tears roll down her eyes. She didn't tell me what was wrong, but she just said, Things aren't very good at my house. I have to look after my mom, which is why I'm so tired. After I got home that day, I told my mom about Sandra. My mom appreciated me being a friend to her in her difficult times. Later, I invited Sandra to my birthday party. It was more of a pool-themed birthday party with some of my other friends. Everyone was having a good time, until a friend of mine named Matthew got up on our high pool platform to jump. As soon as he got up, he called for all of our attention. Suddenly, my eyes went to Sandra, and I saw her face turning pale. The moment Matthew jumped into the pool, we all heard a loud screaming voice. Everyone turned to look, and we saw Sandra screaming and then fainting on the ground. My parents called her home phone, but no one picked up. After lying in bed for about 10 to 15 minutes, Sandra finally opened her eyes. She started to apologize for her unusual behavior, though we were only worried about her health in that moment. I told her it was absolutely fine, and then I asked how she was feeling, to which she replied, I better go home. My mom must be worried. My father then replied, Yeah, we tried to call your house, but no one picked up. Sandra looked at us with an even more embarrassing face and said, Um, maybe she's sleeping. I better go home now. I called out to her, Wait for my dad and I. We'll drop you off. But before I could finish, she quickly took her bag and bolted out of our house. We all felt really weird about her behavior that day. My parents told me to call her back and check how she was doing. I called her three times that night, but she didn't pick up once. She didn't come to school for the next three days. During lunch, Matthew said, I always felt there was something wrong with that girl. I don't know why you would want to be her friend, Riley. I felt bad hearing a comment like that. I decided to call her back that night. After I came home, I called her again. This time she picked up my call. I said in an exciting voice, Sandra, where are you? Why aren't you coming to school? Is everything alright? She replied in a calm voice, yeah, I'm doing fine. I just stayed back home to take care of my mother. It might take a few more days for me to come back to school, you know. I realized she was in a tough situation, so I said, Yeah, I understand that. Listen, I was thinking I could bring you the class assignments myself. I was thinking I could stay over so that I could help you regarding the studies. I knew she badly needed a friend, but was too scared to ask for help. So I volunteered. I was waiting for a reply because she was hesitating. Sandra said, Um... You want to stay at my house? Riley, I would really appreciate your help right now, but... She was cut off. Someone suddenly grabbed the phone from her, and a squeaky female voice took over the call. Hi, it's me Sandra's mother, Lucy Cooper. Sandra spoke to me about you. You're such a sweet girl, Riley. I would love to have you over this Saturday at our house. Do I need to talk to your parents? Everything happened so fast, I could barely figure things out. I said in an awkward tone, no, it's fine. I'll be there on Saturday, Mrs. Cooper. Thank you. She replied in the same squeaky voice. We'll be waiting for you, Riley. And disconnected the phone before I could speak to Sandra. I told my mom that I had been invited to a sleepover at Sandra's house, and that she needed help with her homework and also a friend in a tough situation. My mom agreed to let me go, but she told me to take her cell phone. She was probably just worried about leaving her daughter completely alone with a sensitive little girl and her ill mother. But... I couldn't stop thinking about one thing. If Sandra's mother was so ill, how did she sound so fine over the phone? Anyways, I packed my bag on Saturday morning. My dad decided to drive me to Sandra's house. After driving for 20 minutes max, we reached in front of the tall apartment. My father honked the car horn twice, and I saw Sandra coming out of the gate. She smiled at me and greeted me. I smiled back at her, and then she turned towards my dad and said, Would you like to come upstairs, Mr. Miller? My dad smiled and replied, no thanks, Sandra. I have to leave for some important work. Bye, Riley, and be good. Take care, Sandra. My dad got into the car and drove away. Sandra showed me the way, and we started to go upstairs. She said, This is an old apartment, hence the elevator often gets out of order. There are some issues regarding maintenance. The stairway did look old, and the apartment was extremely quiet. I realized very few people live here. Sandra's apartment was on the fourth floor. And by the time we reached the apartment, I was panting like a dog. I sat down on the couch in the living room. Sandra's mom, Mrs. Cooper, came from the kitchen with lemonade. She was a thin, bony-looking lady. Even though her voice sounded lively over the phone, her face looked extremely pale. Her eyes looked tired, and there were streaks of white hair showing a sign of premature aging. 
I smiled awkwardly and said, Thank you for having me, Mrs. Cooper. She smiled really big and said, Sandra hardly brings any of her friends home. Maybe she's embarrassed by me. And then looked at Sandra with her big smile. And Sandra said, Don't say that, Mom. Among the other school kids, Riley is the only one nice to me. One thing I noticed about Mrs. Cooper is that her eyes kept strolling here and there, as if she was looking for someone. Mom, uh, what's for dinner? Sandra then said. Mrs. Cooper suddenly came back to her senses and replied, I'm making a special chicken pasta for you. Sandra, take Riley to your room. I'll call you when dinner's ready. Sandra then took me to her room. On the way to her room, I saw another room on the left, but that room was locked. I thought to ask whose room it was, but I held back my unnecessary curiosity. Sandra and I sat on our bed, and we started to talk. I told her what was happening around school. We then discussed our assignments and had a good time. She was laughing and smiling. I was talking to her, when suddenly my eyes went to the half-shut door of the room and my stomach dropped. I saw a pair of creepy, wide eyes watching me. The stare was so still that it reminded me of a dead person's eyes. Sandra followed my eyes and said in an awkward voice, What? What is it, Mom? Mrs. Cooper then walked inside the room. She then said in a low voice, Dinner is ready, girls. I came to tell you that. After she left the room, Sandra looked at me and said, Excuse my mom's behavior. Her mental state is not that well. She means no harm, Riley. I didn't say anything, just smiled back at her uncomfortably. The way her mom was watching me was really creepy. Anyway, we finished our dinner, and I thanked Mrs. Cooper for the delicious meal. She then said, It was my pleasure having a sweet girl like you at our house. You know, Sandra's older sister Samantha was just like you. Always looking after her little sister. Until one day. She then got lost in her own thoughts. Sandra immediately said, Uh, l let's go to sleep now. Mom, you should go to sleep too. You need a rest. Mrs. Cooper smiled and went to her room. She didn't even finish what she was eating. I, on the other hand, was shocked to hear Sandra have a sister. I arranged my sleeping bag and finally asked her, You didn't tell me you have a sister? A sense of surprise and discomfort lit up Sandra's face. She replied in a hesitant voice. Yeah, but she doesn't live with us anymore. Thanks for coming and helping me with my assignments today, Riley. I will join the school very soon. I realized she was not willing to talk about her sister, so I just went to sleep. Fast forward to around 2.30 a.m., and I woke up thirsty. There was no water in the room, so I went to the kitchen. The house was in complete darkness. The moonlight coming from the windows helped me make my way. I drank my glass of water. But as soon as I turned back, I saw a figure standing in the main door of the apartment. At first I was going to scream, thinking someone broke in. But then I noticed the eyes, and realized it was Sandra's mom. She was standing with that same lifeless stare and watching me. I said, Oh, uh, Mrs. Cooper, you almost scared me. Why are you up so late? Is everything alright? She smiled and said, I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd go get some fresh air. Do you want to join me? At that point, I was actually a guest in her house, so out of gratitude, I couldn't say no to her. Also, I thought instead of waking up Sandra, I could take care of Mrs. Cooper for a while. I agreed to accompany her. We came out of the apartment. It was a warm summer night. She then said in a whispering voice, Come with me, and started to walk upstairs. I followed her, and we came to the fifth floor balcony. The wind was rushing, the sky was full of stars, and the moon stood right in front of my eyes. Mrs. Cooper stood near the balcony and breathed heavily. I said in a hesitant voice, Uh, so do you come here often, Mrs. Cooper? Mrs. Cooper didn't reply. She kept staring at the bottom of the apartment. She was literally too close to the edge, which freaked me out. I said nervously, Um, it's getting late now. Let's go back, Mrs. Cooper. Sandra will get worried if she wakes up and sees we are gone. Mrs. Cooper didn't move, and she didn't say anything. She just kept staring at the bottom of the apartment. All of a sudden, she looked at me with her creepy wide eyes and said, Jump! I was obviously shocked. I replied, Sorry, what? She then grabbed my hand and repeated herself. Out of fear of this sudden violence in her behavior, I started to scream. Mrs. Cooper, what are you doing? Let me go! She kept screaming in the same voice. Jump! I said jump! Samantha didn't hesitate to jump, then why are you so afraid? My scream woke up the tenants living on the fifth floor. They rushed towards us, and Sandra came running upstairs crying. Mom, Samantha's dead. Why can't you accept that? Mrs. Cooper fainted onto the floor, after screaming for one last time. 
I called my parents instantly, and they took me home that night. My father arranged an ambulance and admitted Mrs. Cooper to the hospital. Sandra is now living with us until her mom gets well. We came to know that two years back, her older sister Samantha jumped from the fifth floor balcony and committed suicide. Her mom couldn't take the shock and turned out to be delusional. If I'm being honest, I feel really bad for them. It was both sad and scary to see what the loss of a loved one did to their family. Hi, my name is Christy. I am currently in high school, but recently, I am going to a psychiatrist. Even a week earlier, I was a happy-go-lucky teenager. I had so many friends, but now I find it difficult to trust all of them. Something happened two days back that has turned my world upside down. I am sure you are all familiar with the online chatting website, Omegle. One of my friends introduced me to this website. This website seemed quite easy than other chatting platforms because there's no need for registration in Omegle. This huge library of remaining anonyms makes the website an easy way to talk to strangers. Many of my friends told me that people often lie in chats about their age, gender, but that didn't bother me much. One day coming from school, I was feeling really bored, so I decided to chat on Omegle. I opened my laptop and started to chat with random strangers. That night, I talked to three different people and it was fun. I saw there is an option for video chat as well, but I wanted to know this website better before going for a random video call with a stranger. What started out as a one night entertainment soon became an addiction. Whenever I got time, I used to chat with people. Last Saturday, I was home alone. My parents went to dinner. I was chatting with a guy named Turner. Things were going good when suddenly my Wi-Fi lost connection and the chat got disconnected. I got up and fixed it, but once the chat disconnected, it's hard to find the same person in Omegle without proper contact. I refreshed the page and again requested a new chat. The page showed me, you are now connected with stranger M19. And then the stranger sent me, hey. I also replied, hi, how are you? After exchanging basic courtesies, I asked, so, are you a male or a female? The stranger replied, I am a 40 year old mother. I liked her honest reply. I also told her that I'm a girl currently studying in high school. You might be surprised, but the more I talked with this woman, the more mysterious her text started to become. I thought to disconnect the chat once, but the way she talked, I couldn't. She told me, I am a pretty girl. I felt happy with her generous behavior. She then asked me if I have a secret that my parents don't know about. Though I felt odd like a stupid moron, I told her that I am dating a much older guy and my parents don't know about him yet. She supported me saying, love can happen anytime and at any moment. Getting such a mental assurance from an adult kind of melted me. I failed to realize how she was luring me into her trap with her sweet words. She suddenly asked me, how well do I connect with my mom? Which felt really weird, but I answered. Like every other teenager, she then said she had to go and put her baby to sleep, but told me to be on the chat. I stupidly waited because, at that point, I had no idea what was going to happen next. I waited for five to seven minutes. Just when I thought she isn't coming back anymore, I started to receive a video chat request from her. So far, I never accepted the video chat of any stranger, but this time, don't know why I did. As we got connected, I saw a woman in her late 40s sitting in front of the camera. She waved at me and said, Hi, Christy. Nice to meet you. I smiled too. We started to talk. She was sitting in her living room because I could see the kitchen area right behind her. There was no striking feature on her face except her nose was sharp and pointy. There were dark circles under her eyes too. I asked her, So, how many people are in your family? She smiled and replied, Oh, it's just me and my husband. I said in a hesitant voice, and your baby? She laughed awkwardly and said, yes, my baby too. Our son Matt is so little that we often forget to count him and kept laughing. <laughs> Honestly, the joke wasn't funny at all. I asked her how old is her son? She replied eight months. I said, oh, that's so cute. I looked at my phone and saw it was 9 p.m. already. I looked at her and said, Samantha, I have to go now. It was nice talking to you. She suddenly stopped smiling and kept staring at my face. Her eyes turned big and she wasn't moving an inch. 
At first, I thought the screen got stuck. I said, Samantha, are you there? She suddenly smiled really big and said, Yes, what were you saying? I felt really weird this time. I said, um, I have to go now, so I was... Samantha interrupted me saying, I feel so horrible. I miss my son and started to cry, <laughs> hiding her face in her palms. I wasn't able to understand what she was saying. I replied, what? What are you saying, Samantha? She looked at me with tearful eyes and said, my, my baby, he died two years back. Trust me, I wasn't at all ready for this shocking news. I said, oh my God, what happened? She stopped crying and again kept staring at me with an expressionless face. There was something really horrible in her lifeless stare. I was feeling freaked out at this point. She then got really close to the camera and said, I can show you what happened to him. I said in a shaking voice, what are you saying? How can you show me that? But before I could ask her more details, she got up and walked to the kitchen. As soon as she reached near the oven, she looked at me once and said, close your eyes. I have a surprise for you. She then made a very creepy laugh. She kneeled in front of the oven and opened it. I saw clouds of black smoke coming out from the oven. I got so scared thinking, is she going to burn down the house or what? She wore a microwave glove and took out a tray from the oven. Something was lying on the tray and I could see it was burnt. She then started to walk close to the camera while holding the tray in her hand. As soon as she reached near me, my heart dropped into my stomach. The hair at the back of my neck stood up. I saw a baby lying on the tray with a melted face and burnt clothes. I screamed, oh my God, what did you do to your baby? Samantha <laughs> laughed and said, no, you don't need to worry. This is not my baby. This is just a small doll, Christy. She then started to laugh. I was speechless. I had no idea what the hell was going on. She was laughing hysterically. I screamed saying, you are one sick woman. Why did you put the doll in the microwave? She said, oh my dear innocent Christy, I just recreated my son's murder for you. It was a lot more fun when I microwaved Matt. He made me paranoid by crying 24 seven. I had no other way but to get rid of him. I couldn't take it anymore. I immediately disconnected the chat and ended up sobbing on the floor. After my parents came home, they found me unconscious, lying on the floor. I told everything to my father. He went to the cops yesterday. The cops are now looking for a woman who has murdered her own son. I can't talk to strangers or chat with anyone anymore. This one incident has traumatized me for life now. I saw a baby lying on the tray with a melted face and burnt clothes. I hope the cops follow up on this matter and help me by finding closure soon. I will not be able to sleep until I get to the bottom of this incident. My name is Chris, and this is the most horrible memory from my childhood days. When I was nine years old, my parents got separated. They were going through a complicated divorce. To keep me out of this, they sent me to stay with my grandma. My grandmother lived in a small town named Springdale. My mom admitted me to the town school. Being the new kid in school is often challenging. In my case, I had bullies. There was one boy in my school named Scott. He was bigger than me and pretty much every other kid my age. Hence, he took full advantage of his strength. Every day from the moment of stepping inside the school, Scott scared the children with his gang. He often snatched my meal, pushed me hard to the ground, and made me do his homework. I was already a shy kid with a troubled household. I knew if I tried to protest, he would just cause more trouble for me. Unfortunately, Scott and I lived in the same area, so he was completely capable of beating the shit out of me on my way home. There was no way I could talk about being bullied in school, because they were already going through a lot. So I just walked home with Scott while he kept making fun of me the entire time. Scott wasn't just mean to kids, but he loved creating trouble in other people's lives as well. He especially loved playing Ding Dong Ditch on our way home from school. It's still a popular outdoor game among kids. There were hardly people in the streets during the afternoon, so Scott used to ring the bells of any random house and then run away. I had to run with him too. 
Sometimes Scott used to force me to ring someone's doorbell while he stood away and was ready to run at any moment. For this stupid idea, I sometimes got caught by homeowners and they scolded me for disturbing them. One day, I was coming home with Scott. It was a hot summer afternoon and there wasn't a single person on the road. Scott said, Let's go to the park. I'm thirsty. The kids' park in our locality had a drinking tap. I was reluctant to go there because it would be an extra 10-minute walk for me. In a hesitated voice, I said, Um, I don't want to go to the park. I have to go home early today. My, my dad is coming to visit me. Scott slapped me on the head and said, Come on, I need someone to carry my bag. Then he laughed like the meanest kid in the world. I had no choice because he would beat me more if I disagreed. We took a left turn ahead and started to walk towards the park. Needless to say, the park was completely empty, and the swings were moving slowly in the wind. I stood beside the water tap holding Scott's school bag while he drank water. I was standing quietly when my eyes went to the other side of the park. I hadn't been to the park much, maybe which is why I never noticed the surroundings properly. I saw a small wooden house standing on the opposite side of the park. Surprisingly, it was the only house in that barren area. It felt like the townspeople had kicked out the owner of the house to live alone. Looks spooky, huh? Scott said to me. I looked at him and asked, Who lives there? Scott took his bag from my hand and said, The Madman. I obviously thought that this was one of his stupid jokes, but I didn't see him smiling or laughing once after saying that. What do you mean by that? I replied. Scott pointed towards the house and said, There lives an old man whom the town called the Madman. People say he murdered his wife and got away with it. The cops never found her body, nor the murder weapon. He was taken into custody for being a suspect behind his wife's sudden disappearance, but there wasn't a single piece of evidence against him. Being honest, this story did scare the hell out of me. I said in a nervous voice, um, we, we should start going home now. My grandma will start looking for me. Scott laughed and said, Someone just chickened out, it seems. I was too scared to start an argument, so I just started to walk as fast as I could. I heard Scott's voice coming from the background. See you tomorrow, moron. Walk faster or the madman will get you. That night, I had a terrible dream. I saw I was standing near the wooden house. The house was completely silent, as if no one was alive inside. Suddenly, I heard a weird sound coming from the window on the left. As I got close to the window and looked inside the house, I saw a creepy looking man with a big knife in his hand, already standing there and watching me. I jolted awake, covered in sweat. During lunch at school, Scott again started to make fun of me for being scared about the wooden house near the park. The more he laughed, the smaller I felt. A sense of anger took me over, and I said in a loud voice, I am not scared of some stupid scary story, Scott. Scott looked me up and down, and then replied, Oh really? Then let's try out your courage today. I also want to see how brave you are, moron and started laughing again. I said, Fine, tell me what I have to do. Scott's eyes dazzled immediately. I knew he was going to come up with one of his bizarre ideas to get me in trouble. But that day, I was also adamant to not give up. Maybe, I thought, if this one time I could prove myself, Scott will finally agree to leave me alone. Scott said, How about we play Ding Dong Ditch after school? You will start with the madman's house. Are you up for that? I said, Yeah, let's do it. After school, Scott and I started to walk towards the park. He was constantly making fun of me. I was really angry, so I avoided him and kept walking quietly. As soon as we took the turn towards the park, my heartbeat grew faster. I just realized what a stupid move I made. We stopped after reaching the middle of the park. The wooden house was standing like yesterday. Scott said in a whispering voice, Ready, Chris? I looked at him with a scowl on my face and started to walk towards the front porch. I prayed to God that this would be over as quick as possible. 
I was at the front door, and the doorbell was on my right side. I turned back and saw Scott was hiding behind a bush at some distance, watching me with a mocking smile. I rang the bell twice and ran like a cheetah. There was a big tree at some distance, and I immediately went behind it and hid. Five seconds went by. A minute passed by. But no one opened the door or even made a single sound. Scott gestured with his hand and told me to ring the bell again. I again walked to the door, and without wasting a single second, rang the doorbell and ran towards the bush where Scott was hiding. I said in a proud voice, So, I rang the madman's doorbell, not just once, but twice, Scott, and laughed like a king. I saw Scott's face turning red in anger. He probably felt ashamed for losing to me. He got up and said, Whatever, I can do this too. Watch, moron. He then carelessly walked towards the porch. Suddenly, my eyes went to the window and I saw someone move inside. I said in a loud voice, Scott, come back, that's enough. Scott turned to me and said, I'll show you what's enough. I'm stronger than you. He walked to the main door and started to ring the doorbell vigorously. He was about to come back when the door unexpectedly opened and someone grabbed his hand. Scott started to scream like a baby. I got up from the bush and saw a horrifying looking man standing on the porch grabbing Scott. The man said in a squeaky, creepy voice, I have been waiting for this moment for so long. I hope you don't scream like the last one. He then licked Scott's cheek with his ugly black tongue. <laughs> I screamed at the top of my lungs. The man started to pull Scott inside. Scott was screaming and trying to get away like a caged bird. Suddenly, I saw a big rock lying beside the bush. I picked it up and threw it on the madman. The rock hit him so hard that I could almost hear his skull cracking. The man fell on the floor while screaming in terrible pain. Scott freed himself in that second and we ran for our lives. Scott didn't come to school for five days. We heard he had caught a high fever. I talked with my mom the very next week, saying I don't like this place and every other trouble I had in school, but I never told anyone about the madman or the wooden house. I don't know where Scott is now, or if the house still even exists, but honestly, I don't even want to know. <laughs> Richa picked up the phone. It was her best friend Emma. She said in an exciting voice, When are you guys coming? Emma replied from the other side, I just called Simmy. I think we'll get there by 8. Richa was super excited. After all, they waited a long time for this sleepover. Her parents were out of town, hence she invited her two best friends to stay the night at her house. Richie even bought some beers and hid them under her bed last night. Upon hearing the girls were on their way, she took them out and put them in the freezer. They were going to have some fun tonight. Richie started to arrange her bedroom. And after getting ready for their night party, Richie came to the living room and sat down on the couch. She waited for 10 or 15 minutes, and then finally the doorbell rang. As she opened the door, Simmy and Emma saw her standing at the doorstep with joyful faces. Emma hugged Richa, and then she said, Let's get this party started. The girls went inside and locked the door. It was really cold that night, so they started the fireplace. The thought of being all by themselves in an empty house gave them all an adrenaline rush. They started to drink some beer and put on some music on the speaker. The party was going well, and all three of them started to feel a little drunk. Suddenly, Emma said, do you guys believe in ghosts? To which Simmy replied, What are you talking about? There's no such thing as ghosts. Richa nodded her head as if to agree, and Emma paused the music and sat near the fireplace. She kept looking at the fireplace for a few seconds and then said, 
There's a way we can summon a ghost, you know. But I don't know if you guys are brave enough to do that. And started to laugh mockingly. Both Simi and Richa felt a bit insulted by Emma's joke. Richa said in a firm voice, Of course we were brave enough. Let's do this. Emma replied in a low voice, Have you heard of the ritual Bloody Mary? Richa and Simi looked at each other with a blank face. Simi then said, What's that? Without taking her eyes from the burning flame of the woods inside the fire, Emma said in a spooky voice, Bloody Mary is an urban legend. People say, if you stand in front of a mirror with a candle in your hand and say Bloody Mary three times, you'll see this horrible looking woman in the mirror smiling at you. Do you guys want to try it? Rachel got scared hearing the story, but she tried to put on a brave face in front of her friends. She didn't want them to think of her as a coward. Simi said, Yeah, let's do it. I'll go first, but I don't think anything's going to happen. Emma got up and switched the light in the living room. There was a big mirror on the wall in the living room. Richa lit a candle and handed it to Simi. They were all a bit tense. The entire house was in the dark, with the only light coming from the candle in Simi's hand. The chilly wind going outside made the ambience even scarier. Simi stood in front of the mirror while Richa and Emma stood right beside her. Emma said in a low voice, Now, say Bloody Mary three times if you dare. Simi looked in the big oval mirror. She could see her tense face and the back of the living room area in the mirror reflection. She paused for a few seconds, and then said in a low voice, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. As soon as she finished uttering those words, the big glass window in the living room banged open making a loud noise. A gush of cold wind came from the room and put out the only light in the house, which was the candle in Simi's hand. And that's when they heard the spine-chilling scream of a woman. Emma rushed to the switch to turn on the lights. Rich was standing with her hands covering her face in fear. Simi was seen sobbing, sitting on the floor. Emma said in a panicked voice, You guys hear that? All of their faces turned pale. Richa responded in a terrified voice, Who was that? Who was that? Honestly, guys, is this a prank you're trying to pull on us? Simi got up and said, Did you guys see the mirror after I said her name? They all slowly peeked into the mirror, thinking they might see a woman's bloody face just as the legend says. But there was nothing. Nothing except the reflection. Emma laughed in relief and said, We might have just imagined the scream. I mean, this was just a story. Honestly, I was just trying to scare you guys. I knew this wasn't real. But before she could finish her words, Richa screamed in terror and Simi fainted on the floor. Confused with the reaction, Emma looked to Richa and saw her white, bloodless face staring at her. Emma realized Richa was looking behind her. She slowly turned back, and what she saw made her heart drop to her stomach. The corridor towards the main door lied behind her, and at the end of the corridor she saw a woman. A woman with a terrifyingly <laughs> bloody face was looking at them. Blood was dripping from her eyes and her nostrils. The woman was wearing a white sleeping gown. Her hands were filled with blood too. She had huge white eyes with a tiny black pupil dot inside them. The woman then smiled horrifyingly. Her smile was spread from one ear to the other. She said in a demonic voice, You called for me? Now, here I am. I must take one of you. Who will it be? <laughs> and started to laugh hysterically. Emma and Richa felt her laugh didn't even belong to this world. She was utter evil, from outside and inside. They both screamed in fear and started to run upstairs. Richa ran to her room and Emma followed her. But as soon as they got inside, they locked the door. They heard a loud bang on the door, as if the woman was going to break it down. Richa broke down in tears, sitting in the corner. Emma couldn't keep her mind straight, and out of fear she jumped from her bedroom window to get out. The next morning, cops were flooding all over Rich's house, all while she sat with her parents and sobbed continuously. Simi was admitted into the hospital for being unconscious for over 24 hours. Emma hurt her back and broke her leg after jumping onto the hard ground. And to this day, none of them know if what they saw that night was the ghost of Bloody Mary or something just made up in their drunken imagination. My grandma had an obsession with dolls. The obsession went to such a level that she basically turned the house into a doll museum. She collected dolls from anywhere, and I mean literally anywhere. One time, I went to the grocery store with my grandma. We were coming home, and on our way my grandma saw a broken doll laying on the roadside. She picked it up and brought it home. So yeah, 
I grew up amidst a lot of dolls, and not all of them were nice. My grandpa was popular as a ventriloquist at a young age. I think that's how grandma's liking towards dolls came in the picture. My father worked in the Navy, and my mom passed away when I was five years old. My grandparents took care of me. I only saw my dad once or twice a year during the holidays. Not having a mother did upset me at first, but my grandma showered me with all her love. I got used to living around the dolls. Until one day, my grandpa received a package from his old friend. As he unwrapped the foil, we discovered a mid-sized clown doll lying inside a wooden box. Now, I've seen a lot of dolls, but this one in particular creeped me out. Maybe because of how big it was. It was almost the size of a toddler. The more closely I looked at its face, the more chilling vibes it gave me. My grandpa said that he had a friend named Marco, who was a ventriloquist with him, and this was his dummy. Having a clown doll as a ventriloquist dummy seemed really odd. There was a letter inside the package. My grandpa opened the letter and read it out loud. Dear Samuel, if you're reading this letter, then I am no longer in this world. You've been a good friend to me, even though we hardly met each other for the last couple of years. I'm leaving Willie at your responsibility. You know he can get cranky if he's not treated right. All you need to do is treat him as your own family member. Include him in your meals, and always make him sleep inside his box. Don't put him elsewhere. He doesn't like changes. I only trust you with him. Your dear friend, Marco. My grandma said in a surprised voice, That's a lot of caution for a simple doll. Grandpa laughed and said, Well, you haven't seen Marco with Willie. In those days, he treated Willie like his own son. He even told me once that Willie cried all night because Marco forgot to kiss him goodnight. To me, all these stories didn't feel adorable, but rather I was spooked to see this new addition into our doll collection. But with more passing days, I started to realize there was something really wrong with the clown doll. My grandparents surprisingly started to treat Willie like an actual family member. Maybe they felt bad for Marco. I was already annoyed with the presence of this doll, so I stayed away from it as far as possible. One night, we sat for dinner. I was about to start eating when my grandma said, Cassie, please bring Willie for dinner. I was reluctant, but to avoid further discussion about the stupid doll, I got up and brought Willie. There was something about the eyes and the smile of the clown that made me feel like there was an actual person living under it. I mean, its expression felt so lively and equally creepy. After finishing dinner, I was about to go to bed. My grandpa took Willie and put him in his box. My room was right next to the doll room. I was sleeping when a sudden sound of footsteps woke me up. At first, I thought I imagined it, but within a few seconds, I felt someone was standing right outside my door and watching me. I immediately got up in fear and switched on the light. I clearly remember shutting my door before going to bed, when I found the door wide open. Next morning, at breakfast, I asked my grandpa if he had come to my room last night, but he said he didn't, and neither did grandma. This wasn't the only incident that started to grow a sense of fear in me. A few days later, I was watching TV in the living room alone. The doll was perfectly visible from where I was. Unfortunately, my grandpa kept the clown door right in front of my room entrance. My eyes were often going to the doll in the room. I was feeling very irritated because it seemed like the clown was watching me with its wide eyes. At some point, my level of patience gave in and I got up. I grabbed a white sheet from the rack and covered the doll with it. I came back to my spot and started to watch the TV peacefully. 15 to 20 minutes passed by without incident, but suddenly I heard a coughing sound. I thought it was my grandma, so for the first few seconds I didn't react. But with time, the coughing sound intensified, as if someone was unable to breathe. My grandpa rushed downstairs thinking something had happened to me. But after discovering me all fine, he got shocked too. We were trying to figure out where the sound was coming from, and my eyes went to the doll room. I don't know if you'll believe me or not, but the white cloth that I used to cover up Willie was drenched in blood stains. Stains as if someone coughed blood into it. My grandpa and I rushed over and lifted up the cover. There were drops of blood on Willie's lips. Just to say, we were completely terrified of what just happened. My grandpa said, Did you cover him, Cassie? I replied, I mean, yeah, I was watching TV and his eyes were creeping me out. I mean, it's just a doll, right? My grandpa said in a confused voice. 
This is really weird. How come there's blood on his lips? No one could come to a rational explanation about the incident. But since that day, I became sure that this doll is no doubt haunted. I couldn't say that to my grandparents though, as they were in confusion about what to believe. But what happened that night was enough to traumatize me for life. After dinner, I came to my room and lied down. I couldn't shake off the thought that the coughing sound was made by none other than Willie. It made me terrified to think that I actually made it difficult for him to breathe, which is why he started to cough blood to drive our attention. But can a simple doll do all this? This question was driving me crazy. I don't really remember when I dozed off, but a bizarre sensation woke me up. I felt someone was breathing on my face. As I opened my sleepy eyes, it took me a few seconds to adjust to the sight. But as soon as it did, my heart dropped to my throat. The clown, Willie, was standing right next to my bed and breathing on my face. His eyes were so close to mine that I couldn't tell if it was real or just a dream. That's when I saw his eyes turning blood red. His face was filled with anger, as if he wanted me dead. I tried to scream, but he placed his cold, bony finger on my lips and said in a squeaky, spine-chilling voice, Be quiet, Cassie. Then took a few steps back and smiled, showing his big yellow teeth. Before I could guess what was about to happen, Willie floated in the air and then jumped on me. I couldn't take it anymore and screamed at the top of my lungs and hit the doll with my bed lamp. The doll fell on the floor, making a loud thud. My grandparents came running and found me sobbing, sitting on my bed while Willie was lying on the floor. I knew it wasn't a dream, and I knew I couldn't stay with this doll anymore. My grandpa switched on the lights. I told him what exactly happened. He then walked towards the doll and picked it up. But who knew, the actual horror was yet to be unfolded. As he took a close look over Willie's face, he said, What is this? Looks like there's something underneath this doll. He then sat down on the chair nearby. My grandma and I stood quietly with scared eyes. Due to the strike of the lamp, Willie's forehead got cracked in the left side corner. My grandpa started to take out the fiber coating. After some time, we discovered a terrible truth. There was a small, weary skeleton lying under the doll. And there were remains of a dead human being inside the doll. My grandpa went to the cops with the doll. The cops found out that Marco had a son, but his son passed away with black fever. But to keep his son with him forever, Marco stuffed his son's skeleton inside the clown doll. The cops burnt the doll, and since then, my grandparents stopped bringing any dolls into our house. <laughs>
I replied, When you die, you die. That's all, Trinka. Trinka smirked at me and said, Where do you stay? I told her the street name, but not the full address. She started to <laughs> laugh like a child. I said with surprised eyes, What happened? What's, what's so funny about my address? She said, <laughs> It will take 10 minutes to meet me, David. I am in that street area now. I got shocked and said, Really? Trinka nodded her head and then said, You know there's going to be a late night party at my house tonight. I think you should come. It will be fun. I checked the time on my phone. It was 11 p.m. already. Trinka said, The storm has stopped too. This is my house address. See you at 12 a.m. sharp. I heard the sound of her doorbell and she disconnected the video call abruptly. For a minute, I couldn't believe what just happened. Did I really get an invitation to a party from a beautiful girl whom I just met online? It got me anxious thinking should I go or not, but in the end, my rational senses gave up. After all, it was a party and I was looking to socialize. So I got up and went to the washroom. I was keeping my expectations low, hence I wore a simple t-shirt and a pair of jeans. I copied the address on my phone. It was Subscribe Street, IMR Lane, house number 2021. Trinkle was right. It took me 12 minutes to reach there by car. The house was in complete darkness. At first, it felt like no one lived there. I walked to the main door and rang the doorbell. It made the exact same sound I heard during the video call. I was feeling really stupid at that time. Suddenly, the door opened and I saw Trinka. She smiled at me and said, Hi, David. Welcome to my den. I entered the house. The living room was filled with candles. The entire decor of the house was almost like Halloween. I already saw Trinka being interested in gothic styles and decor. Trinka was wearing a black cloak. There were five to seven people inside the house. They were sitting in a circle. A girl came to me and handed me a black robe. I asked Trinka, what kind of party is this? She replied, we are going to call him. I said in a low voice, who? Trinka replied, you ask so many questions. Keep quiet and join us. I sat down inside the circle. I counted and realized after including me and Trinka, it was a circle of nine people. Suddenly, a guy lifted his arm. He was holding a sharp pointing knife in his hand. Trinka got up and left the room. I was trying to figure out what the hell is going on here when I heard a weird sound. A childlike baby was crying in the house. Trinka came out holding a newborn baby in her hand. The entire group got up and raised their arms into the air. They all started to chant something in a whispering manner. It took me time to realize they were doing a cult ritual. Trinka placed the baby in the center of the circle. The guy then got up and went on to stab the baby. I screamed saying, what are you doing? Are you all out of your mind? <laughs> they all started to laugh like maniacs. I knew I had stepped into trouble right at that moment. I was thinking to snatch the baby and run away, but they were surrounding me like hellhounds. They all stopped laughing and Trinka came right in front of me. She said in a scary voice, Do you want power, David? Aman is going to show us life after death. You completed our circle, David. Now all you have to do is sacrifice this baby to make our final offering to Aman. Come. Praise him with us. I took a few steps back and said, You all are sick. If I knew this was your intention, I would not have come here, Trinka. I was thinking at the back of my mind about how to escape this coat group when I heard a cop siren outside. I realized the cops might have figured out the location of this missing baby and have come to catch these culprits. Without thinking much, I ran to the back door and as soon as I came out, I locked the door from the outside. I saw a big shovel lying at the back door. I used it to block the door from the outside so none of them can come out. I wanted to take the baby with me, but I didn't have time for this. The cops broke the main door and busted in. I ran away and hid behind a bush at some distance from the house. The cops caught the entire gang. I saw Trinka screaming at them. We had another member. He ran away. Go catch him. His name was David. But the cops didn't listen to her. I came home like a criminal. I didn't go out for a month. I saw their group on the news. They stole the baby from a local hospital. They have been sentenced to prison and I 
am still scared thinking about what would have happened if I didn't run away that day. I'm just glad the newborn has been returned to its family. It scares me how Trinka tried to frame me that day. I am glad I didn't use my real name while chatting in Omegle. After my parents' unfortunate death, I lost my house for not being able to pay the rent. I was on the verge of living on the streets. One evening, I was sitting in the city park. I had no idea of what to do with my life. Just then, I heard a familiar voice. I looked up and saw Candace standing at some distance. She was my classmate in high school. She came for a run in the park. Hey Beth, where have you been? She came towards me with a surprised face. I smiled awkwardly. She sat down beside me and said, Beth, is everything all right? You don't look good. I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears and told her about my miserable life. Candace calmed me down and took me to her apartment. She was working in a cafe. She told me I could crash at her place until I found a job. I started looking for jobs, any job that I could find. I used to walk all over town looking for one opportunity to earn money. One day, I was working part-time in a departmental store when Candace called me. I took her call and she said, Hey Beth, can you come home quick? I just got a permanent job for you. This might help you. I finished my work as soon as possible and headed for home. Candace told me she met a guy in the cafe today. The guy said he works in an institution as a researcher. They have valuable specimens and are looking for helpers for night shifts. Candace added, I know how desperately you wanted to get back to your studies. You should go and see this place. I think this might be your chance, Beth. Even though working the night shift can be a bit unsafe for a woman, Candace was right. All I wanted was to save for my studies so that I can have a dignified life ahead. I took the phone number from Candace and dialed it. The phone rang for a few seconds, then a man picked it up. Hello, how may I help you? The man said in a serious voice. I explained how I wanted to apply for the night job and every other detail. The man said he is going to text me the address and a time for an interview tomorrow. After hanging up the call, I received a text from the same number. The text read, IMR Research and Training Facility. 2021 Subscribe Street. I went to bed with hope and excitement after a very long time. I fell asleep thinking tomorrow is the day that can help me start my life all over again. The next morning, I got dressed and went to the address the man gave me. The place looked like a hospital, except the staff appeared to be researchers and scientists. I called the man again and he told me to wait near the main gate after two, three minutes, an average height man came out wearing a lab coat. He said, Hello, you must be Beth. I am Jonathan. Please, come with me. As I entered the facility, I saw patients here and there, except all of them seemed highly sedated. Most of them were strapped to wheelchairs. I saw an old woman sitting on a bench nearby. She was dozing off unnaturally. I asked Jonathan, um, what is this place? He replied, this is a mental institution, but not just any mental institution. Along with sheltering patients, we run tests on them too. Let's go to my office. I will tell you in detail. On my way to Jonathan's office, I realized why he picked a random girl like me for this job. I was sure that these people do many things which can be termed as illegal. Probably this is why he was looking for an amateur who wouldn't be a threat to their scientific research. We got into his cabin and sat down to talk. Jonathan told me they have only a few patients here, as most of them have already been shifted to a new place. It's a matter of one month and they will shift the rest of them too. I asked in a surprised voice, but Candace told me this is a permanent job. Jonathan smiled and said, Look Beth, you seem like a smart girl. I hope you have already figured out that some of our research activities can be identified as non-governmental, hence why we have to shift to a more secluded place to run them smoothly. You will be assigned to a specific job, 
If you manage to get through that and still want to work with us, we can assure you a guaranteed employment no matter where we go. We will pay you a handsome salary too. Everything he said sounded so nice to me, but the word specific job got my attention. I said in a confused voice, um, what kind of job? Jonathan said, we have a few female patients who are too old to care for themselves. Irrespective of medical supervision, they need extra care, so you will be appointed to work four-hour night shifts regularly until we shift them to a new facility. The work sounded like being a helper to these elderly women, so I agreed, and it was a hell of a lot of money. I came home, packed a few things, and left for my night shift. At night, the facility looked creepy. Jonathan handed me the room keys for three female patients and their food charts and medicine details. I was talking to him when suddenly my eyes went to a large iron bolted door at the end of the corridor. The nameplate on the door read, Caution, SCP-082. I couldn't understand this weird coding system, so I asked Jonathan, What is behind that door? As soon as I asked him the question, he looked at the door and I saw his face turn pale. He then said in a low voice, that is a restricted area. You must stay away from that door. Tomorrow we are going to shift him. I said, him? Is he a patient like the others? Jonathan looked at me and said, I have given you all the details you need for your work. See you tomorrow, Beth. All the best. I couldn't ask him more because he left the conversation abruptly. I started my job without thinking more about the room with the iron door. I fed the women and put them to sleep after giving them their medication. I decided to sit on the bench in the corridor and watch some YouTube videos to spend the last bit of my night shift in peace. I don't remember when I dozed off, but suddenly I woke up hearing a sobbing voice. It sounded like a man was whimpering in pain. I got up and started to follow the sound. As soon as I came near the iron door, the sobbing stopped. I said in a hesitant voice, Hello? Are you alright? No reply came back. I turned around to go back to my seat, just when I heard a voice coming from behind the door. Are you new here? A man spoke. I replied, Yes, I just joined today. The man then said in a painful voice, My stomach hurts. They haven't fed me for days. Please, help me. I said in a surprised voice, What? Why didn't they feed you? The man then replied, This is how they torture people. For scientific experiments. Don't you know that? I suddenly felt very bad for the guy. I said in an awkward voice, But I can't open the door. It's locked. How am I supposed to pass you food then? The man then said, you see the red button beside the door? Press it. The security system will turn off for a while. And then I will be able to unlock this door. I had no idea my one stupid mistake would change everything. Out of pity and sorrow for the patient, I opened the glass lid covering the red button on the wall and pressed the button. The entire facility shut down in a wink. The corridor went into complete darkness as the electricity went off immediately. For a second, there was pin drop silence everywhere. And suddenly, a loud thud appeared right next to my ear. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and saw the thick iron door had been crushed like a piece of paper. Amidst the pitch black darkness, I heard a demonic laughter. Instantly, I realized why Jonathan told me to stay away from this door. I realized I made a huge mistake by stepping into the trap of this patient behind the door. And now I have set him free. I said in a scared voice, Please go inside. You must abide by the rules of this place. A voice spoke from the darkness. You look too young for this job, Beth. My stomach dropped, and suddenly, the lights came back on. The alarms started to go off in the entire facility. Four to five guards 
dressed in protective suits, arrived from the security room. One of them screamed, saying, What have you done? And I saw a gigantic figure standing at the end of the hallway, smirking at me with its blood-red eyes. Two guards rushed towards the giant, trying to stop him, but he grabbed one of them by the neck and smashed his skull with his bare hands. One by one, he killed all of them. I was stunned, frozen in shock. He then grabbed a dead guard from the floor and looked right into my eyes. He smiled for the last time and said, Sorry for not introducing myself earlier. I am Fernand, the cannibal. Thanks, Beth. I hope to see you again. He then kicked the wall in front of me and escaped the facility. I fainted on the floor, screaming out loud. The next morning, Candace came to visit me in the hospital. She told me the entire facility had been shut down in just one night. Cops are saying it was some kind of secret laboratory for extremely violent research processes. They have found a few dead bodies, but no one could identify those men. I don't know what happened to Jonathan and where Fernand is now. I don't even know why he was referred to as SCP-082, but whatever it was, I'm done with night shifts for my entire life. This happened recently. I'm an 18-year-old college girl. I came from a small family. My dad owns a small local store, and my mom works in a restaurant. I was a bright student since childhood, so my grades helped me get a few scholarships, which eventually paved my way to college. Even after a scholarship, college education proved to be quite expensive for a girl like me. So I decided to babysit. In my opinion, babysitting was better than a full-time job, as it gave me time to concentrate on my studies and also have an income to support my daily expenses. After doing it five to six times, I became quite confident and carefree about the perks of the job. And that was until one incident that occurred in my life. Last week, I saw an advertisement for a babysitting job on our college website. Our college forum had a website to offer basic jobs for students to help them with their side income. One day, I was sitting in the college library going through the website for jobs when an ad caught my attention. The ad was given by a man named Mr. Wood. It said he needed a babysitter on the coming Saturday night for his twins, Marla and Roni. As I already said, I gained good experience in this field, so without wasting much time, I dialed the contact number. Mr. Wood told me to reach their house on Saturday night. I needed the money really bad, so instead of going to the club with my friends, I decided to work. As instructed, I reached the house mentioned in the address. The house was quite fancy. It was on the top of the hills, with no other neighboring houses nearby. The house was no doubt far away from my town, so I informed my dad just to be safe. I walked up to the stairs and reached the house porch. Hesitantly, I rang the doorbell. After waiting for two to three seconds, I heard footsteps walking up to the door. Finally, the door opened and I saw a man in his late 40s standing in an expensive suit. The man checked me out, which obviously made me uncomfortable and then said, You must be Lisa. Come on in. I smiled awkwardly and went inside the house. The house was even more luxurious from the inside. Big couches were facing a huge TV screen. A stair went up on my left, which I guess led to the bedrooms. The man then poured himself a drink and said, I'm John Wood. Please take a seat. I sat down and he called out in a firm but irritated voice. Marla, Roni, she's here. Come on down. As soon as he said it, I heard running footsteps from upstairs. A girl and a boy, aged between three and four years, came down and stood silently in the living room. Now, I've seen a lot of kids, but there was something off about these ones. I smiled at them and said, Hi there, I'm Lisa. The girl looked at Mr. Wood. Mr. Wood gestured her to answer me, but none of them said a thing. Mr. Wood said in a strict voice, Marla, say hi to Lisa. Now. The girl smiled like a robot and said, Hi, I'm Martha. This is Roni. I didn't like the way Mr. Wood pressured the kids to interact, because kids take time to mix in with new people. Also, seeing the boy and the girl, I felt they were scared of their father. 
I figured Mr. Wood might be a strict father, as raising two kids alone can be tough. Mr. Wood finished his drink and then said, Lisa, I have a very important business meeting tonight. I'll be back by 9pm, and don't worry, I'll arrange an Uber for your return once I come back. There is plenty of food in the fridge, and the kids go to sleep at 8pm sharp. Make yourself comfortable. Mr. Wood then called someone, probably his business client, and said, Yeah, I'm coming in a half hour. He went again to the kids for one last time and said, Don't do anything that you shouldn't do. And listen to Lisa. Alright, good night, you guys. Fathers can be strict when it comes to disciplining their children, but this father wasn't just harsh on them. He was somewhat emotionless, too. Mr. Wood left in his car, and I locked the main door. As I turned around, I saw the kids sitting on the couch and staring at me with their big, wide eyes. And the boy, Roni, didn't say a single word so far. So I went to him and said, It's just 6.30, and you guys have a lot of time before going to bed. So, do you guys want to do something for fun, or just watch TV? Roni looked at his sister Marla and said, She doesn't even look like us. I wasn't expecting this comment. I looked at them with a surprised face and said, Uh, what do you mean? Marla immediately replied, Can we watch some cartoons until bedtime? I realized what she was doing. Marla was being the bigger sister and trying to hide something regarding what his brother said. I just dropped the topic as well and said, Okay, sure. The kids sat down on the couch and started to watch TV. It was a busy day and I barely had lunch. I opened the fridge and it was stacked with food. Like, literally too much food. I mean, the people living in the house was only one adult and two toddlers. Hence the hoarding of the food felt a bit odd at first. And then I thought, maybe it's difficult to run by the general store due to the distance. I sat down on the table near the kitchen window with a slice of cake. At other times, I have to play games with the kids. But these kids were different, as I already said. The view from the table didn't cover the entire living room area, but it was perfect to keep an eye on the kids. The kids were laughing while watching cartoons. I got busy on my phone while eating the cake. I don't know how long I remained distracted, but suddenly I felt the ambience was too quiet. I lifted up my face and my heart dropped. Marla and Roni were sitting on the floor like statues, and they were just watching me. Even though they were just two small kids, this weird stare creeped me out at that moment. I said, Um, guys, what happened? Why are you sitting on the floor? And they kept staring at me, and didn't say a single word. And they didn't even look away. They were just staring at me with an expressionless face. I got up and said, Okay, enough now. Let's put you guys to bed. It's already 7.30. Your dad will be here any minute now. Marla and Roni got up slowly. They looked at each other and said, his name's Mr. Wood. He prefers to be called by that name only. I thought it was weird, but I ignored it. I went towards them and held their hands to take them upstairs. Suddenly, Marla said, Why didn't you come to visit us all the time? I had no idea what these kids were talking about. I crouched onto their level and said, What are you talking about, Marla? Is everything alright with you two? Before Marla could answer my question, Roni said in a sad face, You were supposed to come earlier. Mr. Wood brought us here to meet you. Don't you love us? The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was beyond confused at whatever these kids were telling me. I said in a clueless tone, Why would I come visit you guys? And what do you mean by Mr. Wood brought you here? Marla broke into tears and said, Please, Mom, take us with you. The sky above my head broke upon me. Mom? Sorry, sweetheart, but I'm not your mom. Can you please tell me what's going on here? I replied. Marla said, But you are. Mr. Wood said that you're our mom, but that you'll be angry if we called you that. So we didn't say anything at first. Are you angry? I realized there was something really wrong with these kids in their lives. I sat them both down and said, Who's Mr. Wood? Is he not your father? Roni replied, Marla and I lived with the other children earlier in that old house. Mr. Wood talked to Aunt Christy and brought us here. He said he'd take us to our mother. Last night he said our mom was coming to meet us, and then you came. Please take us with you before Mr. Wood sends Roni to some other house. And the situation was getting more and more tense with each second. Hearing these kids made me feel like this actually was not their house, and the man I just met was not really their father. I said, Mr. Wood wants to take Roni where? Marla replied with the same sad face. He said we'd be sent to stay with other people, and then one day, when we would grow up, 
He said he'd bring us back to you. But I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to be with you, Mom. And I realized finally that these kids were in grave danger. And without wasting a second, I immediately called my dad. He called the cops, and they came to rescue the kids. And the cops later arrested Mr. Wood that same night. And it turns out this man was trafficking kids. He used to buy children from poor orphanages, and then would sell them who knows where. He must have had the same plan for these kids if they didn't meet me. Marla and Roni are now being adopted by a nice couple in our town. I often go to see them, and they still call me mom, which I guess I don't mind, because whether they were my children or not my children, they deserve to be treated like children. I honestly feel proud of myself that I could save two young lives from getting lost in the darkness of this world. This happened amidst the 2020 lockdown. I used to work in a publishing house as a graphic designer, and my office instructed most of the employees to start working from home. I live alone in a small house. The place I live in is known for its quiet and safe environment. At least that's what I used to think. It was a hot summer night. I was going through tremendous work pressure. It was a tight deadline. My house has a moderately sized living room with an open kitchen area. My bedroom is upstairs, and there's a guest bedroom beside it, which I actually turned into my workplace. My boyfriend and I planned to move in together, hence we rented this house. But before we could officially move in there, the coronavirus outbreak took place, and I was compelled to live alone in that house. Beside my house, there was another house. A middle-aged married couple lived in it. They were always fighting and arguing, though. I could hear the woman scream at her husband every night, even though pretty much everyone was annoyed with this family, no one ever dared to confront them. I was just hoping everyone wanted to stay out of the fights just like me, but avoiding trouble is obviously not the way to solve it. It was a Saturday night, and I was talking to my boyfriend sitting in my living room. We were obviously upset about not being able to see each other. The weather outside was cloudy in the afternoon, and a thunderstorm was going on outside now. I was pretty surprised to see how awfully quiet the neighboring couple was. I mean, usually, they start yelling at each other in the afternoon, but that day, there was pin drop silence. I finished the call with my boyfriend, and then went to the kitchen to prepare dinner. Though within five minutes, the rain picked up, and it started to get really heavy. This sudden strike of lightning spooked me a bit. I was chopping vegetables, and the power even went out. Alone in a new house amidst a thunderstorm was enough to unsettle my mind, and now with the power cut, I was pretty disturbed if I'm being honest. I lit up a candle, and started to search for more just when I heard a knock on my door. I was thinking whether I should open the door or not, just when another huge lightning struck nearby, almost making my ears numb. I walked close to the door, and said in a hesitated voice, Who is it? No one replied, but again I heard the knocks. I said in a loud voice, Who are you? The man replied in a panicked voice, Um, ma'am, I live next door. My wife is not feeling well, can you please open the door? I recognize the man's voice. I've heard that same man's voice screaming at his wife several times. I opened the door, and a flash of lightning made me see his face. The dude was literally sweating. I could tell from his face that something serious had happened. I asked in a worried voice, What happened? The man replied with, My wife isn't feeling well, and I need to get some medicine for her. I can't leave my dog alone in the house. Is there any chance you could keep an eye on him until I come back? I thought for a second, but the man wasn't asking much, so I couldn't say no. I agreed, and the man brought in his dog. It was honestly a really cute dog, but I don't know why the dog was acting strange. Every time the man tried to grab the dog, it kept straying away from him. I was confused. Seeing a pet acting against his owner was not a common occurrence. It was quite evident that for some reason the dog didn't like that man. I took the dog inside and locked the door. I watched the man driving away in his car. What worried me most was that he left his sick wife alone, but was insanely concerned about the dog, even though the dog hates him. I didn't think much of it, and got busy cooking dinner again. The storm was growing heavier and louder. I guessed there must have been a huge short circuit, which is why the entire area had lost its power. I finished my dinner, and even gave the dog some food to eat. Now, my bedroom window is faced towards the bedroom window of that man and his wife. I took the candle upstairs and stood near the window. Even though the house was in complete darkness, the flashes of lightning were showing the bedroom in glimpses. I could see their bed, and that someone was lying on it. I thought it was his wife, and was probably just sleeping. 
my sense of curiosity has always been quite low. So I just went to bed and gave the dog a place to sleep beside it. I don't exactly remember what time it was, but I woke up hearing a strange sound. I got up on my bed and went to the window. And that's when I saw two people standing in the bedroom of my neighboring house. The storm had stopped by now, but the power hadn't come back on yet. With the sound of voices, I figured it was a man and a woman. I realized the man had come back, and it must have been him and his wife. I looked at the clock and saw it was 10 p.m. I was leaving early the next day to meet my boyfriend. That's what we planned that evening, so I thought it would be easier if I just returned the dog right then. I was about to go wake up the dog, just when I saw something weird happen in the couple's bedroom. The man and the woman were carrying a third person out of the room. I got closer to the glass just to have a clear look. And just then, the power came back on, causing the room's lights to flick on. That's when my stomach dropped in fear. I saw the man was indeed the husband, but the woman he was talking to was not his wife. It was a completely unknown woman I'd never seen before, and both of them were carrying a person on their shoulders. I could easily make out that third person was that man's wife. Her throat was slashed badly, but her blood had dried. It was evident from the look of her body that she had been dead for hours now. They didn't see me watching them, but suddenly the dog barked and the man started looking straight at me. Our eyes met, and he rushed out of the house at that moment. I didn't know what to do, but out of fear and panic, I too ran downstairs. I knew this man had realized that I now knew his secret. I knew that if this man caught me, there was no way I was getting out of this situation alive. I was a witness of his wife's dead body. I got to the main door and heard the man banging on it. He said in a loud but panicked voice, Ma'am, I just came to get my dog. My friend is here to help me take my wife to the hospital. We might stay there for a while, so I would appreciate it if you opened the door and returned my dog to me. I was positive. Whatever he was telling me was a lie. All he wants now is for me to open the door so he can silence me like his wife. I responded, telling him I was going to call the cops and I knew the whole situation. The man banged on my door even harder and replied, You're misunderstanding the situation. Why don't you just return my dog and mind your own business? Open this door right now. I double locked my door so that the man couldn't enter. I then dialed 911 and reported the incident. I was panicking, but as soon as I hung up the call, I heard footsteps running away. Out of my window, I saw the man and the woman hopping in the car and driving away at high speed. When the cops came, they were nowhere to be found, but they did discover the wife's dead body laying on the bedroom floor. The entire story unfolded while the cops investigated the matter. The man was having an affair with the woman I saw that night. They planned to murder his wife and vanish her body without anyone's knowledge. That was why the man made up the story about his wife being sick. He must have wanted to use me as an alibi for going out of his house that night. The man planned to come back during midnight and quietly get rid of his wife's body. He would have then had to come to me to get his dog back and say something like his wife left him or something. And after generating that idea in my mind that he had no knowledge of his wife's whereabouts, he would have moved out. In this period of lockdown, people would have hardly gone out of their houses looking for them. The man would have been successful in his plan if he didn't care about his dog so much. My boyfriend finally moved into the house the next day. It was honestly terrifying to stay in the house next door to where your neighbor had been murdered. The cops are still searching for them to this day, and I can only pray that they get caught soon. The content of this story can be disturbing to some people. This is a true incident that ruined my life and I still go to therapy for to get over the trauma. When I was 10 years old, I moved into a new house with my mom and dad. This house was in a beautiful neighborhood. My dad took a teaching job at a high school in that area. We were excited about a fresh start. I actually even joined the same school where my dad became a new history teacher. On the first day of school, I was shy and nervous, but the kids in my class behaved nicely to me. There was where I met Sally. Sally was a cheerful girl. She had a lot of friends. She introduced me to everyone in the class, and soon enough I got mixed with the kids of the town. Sally and I often hung out together. One day, after school, I was coming home with my dad when I saw Sally getting into our principal Mr. Sherman's car. After asking my dad, I came to know Mr. Sherman was Sally's stepfather. I honestly felt pretty impressed that even after being the daughter of a principal, Sally was still so down to earth. Days passed, and our friendship grew stronger. We started to share secrets. And one day, Sally and I were walking down the school corridor when a boy named Rogan accidentally bumped into her. Rogan immediately got up and started to apologize, but just then Sally slapped him and started to scream. 
I was shocked. I didn't think she would react like that. The teachers ran towards us and took her away. Later that day, Sally and I got called to the principal's office. As we entered, we saw Mr. Sherman sitting on his recliner while Rogan sat opposite of him. I noticed Rogan's cheek. It was still red. Rogan's mom and my dad were standing in the corner looking at us. Mr. Sherman stared at me and said, Julia, you were the only one who was standing close to both Sally and Rogan. Can you please tell me exactly what happened there? Before I could start speaking, Sally said in a screaming voice, He did it intentionally. Mr. Sherman scolded her in a loud voice, saying, You will not say a single word until you are asked to. Sit down and be quiet if you don't want to be suspended. Sally sat down and started to sob silently. I said in a shaking voice, We were, we were walking, and Rogan slipped accidentally, then bumped into Sally. But he was standing behind her, so there's no way she could have seen him coming. Rogan's mom spoke in a soft voice. Mr. Sherman, don't be so hard on your kid. It was just an accident. Sally has always been a really nice girl. Mr. Sherman looked at Sally and said in a cold voice, Apologies to Rogan, now. And if you ever react this way again, I will suspend you for a month. Sally apologized to Rogan, then left the principal's room in tears. Rogan and I both felt bad for her. Sally didn't talk to anyone for the entire day and left for home without even saying goodbye to me. I thought she got angry at me for not supporting her in the morning. After coming home, I even called her. Instead of Sally, her mom picked up the phone this time. Hello? Who is this? She said. I replied, Mrs. Sherman, can I talk to Sally? I'm her friend Julia. Mrs. Sherman replied in an awkward voice. I'm sorry, dear, but Sally's not in the mood to talk to anyone today. I'm sure she'll meet you tomorrow at school. At that point, I was sure Sally was angry with me, and we were never going to be friends again. Next day at school, I was standing on the corridor waiting for Sally, and I saw her coming with Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman came to me with her and said, Sally's lucky to have a friend like you, and smiled and left towards his office. Sally stood beside me and said, I'm sorry for that mess, Julia. I hope we can be friends again. A smile of joy lit my face. I went to go hug her, just when she took a few steps back. She awkwardly said, Uh, I have a cold. You better maintain distance for your good. And smiled. I noticed her the entire day, but not once did she cough or sneeze. Her behavior started to feel odd to me. After our classes, Sally and I both stood near the school exit waiting for our parents to take us home. Sally was looking different that day. I could tell from her face that something was bothering her. I asked in a worried voice, Sally, are you alright? Sally suddenly looked at me with wide eyes. She said hesitantly, Why? Why would you ask me that? I'm more than alright, Julia. I'm just tired. I replied, If anything is bothering you, you can tell me. Sally's face turned upset. I realized there was something she wasn't telling me. But before Sally could speak, I heard Mr. Sherman's voice behind me. Why don't you invite your friend over for a sleepover, Sally? She's such a caring and good friend to you. Sally uncomfortably smiled and said, Yeah, you should come someday for a sleepover. I have lots of toys and we can have fun together. Mr. Sherman then said, Why someday, Julia? Please, come on tomorrow and spend the night with us. I'm sure Sally will be glad to have you. My dad smiled and I nodded to join her for the sleepover. My mom baked a cake to give to the Shermans. She took me to their house, and they had a beautiful house. Sally's room was honestly amazing. Mrs. Sherman and my mom chatted for some time. She then kissed me goodnight and left. After a delicious dinner, Sally and I sat down to watch some TV in the living room. One thing that felt unusual to me was that Sally's behavior turned robotic in front of Mr. Sherman. I could tell from her face she was always nervous around him. Now, Mr. Sherman was always a bit strict, and also it was natural to be a bit distanced from your stepfather. So, I never said anything regarding this to Sally. Around 9pm, Mr. Sherman came to us and said, Okay girls, enough TV for today. It's time to go to bed now. We went to Sally's room. I got inside and locked the door. But instantly, Mr. Sherman came rushing and started banging on the door. Open, open the door. I got extremely shocked and opened the door immediately. Mr. Sherman said in an annoying voice, We don't lock doors in this house, Julia. Specifically, Sally has a habit of going to the washroom at midnight. Also, in case of any emergency, it's better to keep the rooms unlocked. Good night now. He walked away. I said in a relieved voice, Jeez, your father is strict, Sally. She said in an upset voice, My stepfather. My dad loved me a lot. She then lied on her bed. 
I could easily sense the disturbance in this house, but there was nothing I could do. I went to lie down, and that was when Sally said something really weird. Julia, would you mind sleeping on the door side of the bed? I want to sleep near the window. I replied, yeah, sure. We talked for a few minutes more, and gradually fell asleep. I don't recall what time it was, but suddenly a weird sensation woke me up. I felt something was tickling my feet. The tickle was very gentle. It took time to register, but as I opened my eyes, I saw a dark figure standing right next to me. It was a man with wide, creepy eyes. The man then started to move his hand up my leg, and I realized it was not a dream at all. My eyes adjusted to the darkness, and the pale moonlight touched the man's face as he leaned over me. It was none other than Mr. Sherman. I screamed from the top of my lungs, and Mr. Sherman stepped back in response. He said in a scared voice, Julia! This is Sally's side of the bed. Why are you... But before he could say anything further, Sally's mom rushed into our room. She switched on the light and got shocked. I was sitting on the bed with a terrified face, and Sally got up crying out loud. Mrs. Sherman said in a panicked voice, What the hell is going on here? Mr. Sherman said in a fumbled voice, I was just checking if the girls were sleeping. But I now understood how he victimized Sally, and why she was so terrified of someone's touch. Sally sobbed and told everything to her mom. Mrs. Sherman couldn't believe her ears. Mr. Sherman tried to escape, but she grabbed the table lamp nearby and threw it at his head. Mr. Sherman fainted on the floor as blood rushed down from his head. The cops were called, and my mom and dad came. Mr. Sherman was taken into custody for being a child molester. I honestly felt really bad for Sally that she had to go through that trauma at such a young age. I now realize why that night Sally told me to swap sides. It was nothing but a cry for help. I started babysitting in high school for some extra cash. Back in those days, the only phones out were flip phones. So, it's pretty easy to guess this story happened a long time ago. I come from a suburban area. My dad was the local sheriff. Though, our town was boring when it came to crime and antisocial activities, so my dad often complained about not having a thrill in his job. Maybe this is why babysitting was quite a safe and fast-earning option among teenage girls of my age. One day, I was coming home with my friend. We were on the sidewalks, and there were barely any people out. We were talking about common high school stuff when I came close to a flyer board on my left. Back in those days, small towns like ours had bulletin boards to hang flyers and advertisements. There were flyers on general store discounts, local salon advertisements, and many other things. One had caught my eye, though. It was a yellow-colored old pamphlet that read, Babysitter Wanted for a Toddler, and then gave the contact number. Seeing the condition of the pamphlet, I realized it had been there for a long time. I didn't know if the ad was still active, but out of interest to earn some more cash, I took down the phone number on my cell phone. After coming home that evening, I dialed up the number. The line kept ringing for two to three seconds, and then someone picked it up. A man spoke in a low voice saying hello. It was weird though. Just from the sound of his voice, I could tell he was in pain or suffered a long-term illness. I said, Uh, hi there. I saw your advertisement. Are you still looking for a babysitter? The man replied, Yeah, absolutely. It's for my little son. Are you free tomorrow? I instantly replied to this saying yeah, and then the man told me his address and said to be there by 7. And the next day, I decided to head towards the babysitting job right after college. The house was situated on the outskirts of town. It was a wooden house. I walked towards the house porch. I rang the doorbell, and the door creaked open on its own. At first, it startled me a bit. Then I looked down and saw a little boy standing in the doorway. I figured this was the kid the man was talking about. The boy looked frail and weak. I could tell from his wide eyes and bony body that he was not fed properly. I said, Hi, I'm Ellie. Are your parents home? The boy replied in a weak voice. My mom left with the angry man. My dad is sick. Who are you? I replied in an awkward voice, saying that I was called to babysit him. That's when I heard a man's sickly low voice coming from the back of the house. The voice told the kid to let me in. The kid looked at me once again and then let me in. The boy was probably three years old, but he looked in terrible condition. The house interior was stuffy and messy. It had been a long time since someone had cleaned that house, I could tell. At the end of the living room, I saw a bedroom door in the left corner. The boy pointed out in that direction and said, That's my dad's room. 
He hasn't come out for two days since my mom left. He says he's not feeling well. I realize this kid's parents must have split up, and his mom left his dad for some other guy. I knocked on the door. Um, sir, it's me, Ellie. Uh, we talked over the phone about the babysitting job. Are you alright? The man replied in the same voice. I'm fine. I just need some privacy and rest. If you could please go to the kitchen and prepare some food for my son. He hasn't eaten for two days. And then go to the couch. You'll find a phone directory. There you'll find my mother's name under the name Mrs. Martha Saunders. Please call her to come get my son. I'm not well enough to take care of him. I felt bad for this entire family. The kid looked at me with big teary eyes. I replied to Mr. Saunders that of course I would help him, and I asked him if I should call an ambulance for him. He just replied saying that he was fine, and to just take care of his son until his grandma arrived. He also told me that there was a wooden box in the living room, and I was to take $50 for the trouble. People have their own way of coping with marriage issues, so without dwelling further into the family matter, I went to the kitchen. There were unclean dishes everywhere. It was evident from the condition of the kitchen that the place hadn't been used for a few days. I found a packet of ready-to-cook pasta. I made it and placed it on a plate on the table. I then asked the little boy what his name was, and he replied saying he was Ted. I took him on my lap and sat down on the chair near the dining table. I fed him the pasta, and the way he ate it I could tell he really hadn't eaten in a while. I felt bad for him. I felt a sense of anger towards the kid's mother. What kind of mom was she? She could have taken the kid with her, or at least called someone to help with her ill husband. The poor kid remained hungry for two days. After finishing the meal, I decided to give Ted a bath. That's when I noticed he had bruises all over his back. I asked in a surprised voice, What, what happened, Ted? Who did this to you? Ted stood quietly near the bathtub, and then just said that he hates the angry man, and he hates his mom, and they both made his dad sick. I asked if the man hurt him. Ted nodded with his head and hugged me with tearful eyes. My throat became heavy. I was disgusted knowing how anyone could do this to a child. I decided to tell his grandma so that she could call the cops and report the whole situation. The man he was talking about was probably his mom's boyfriend. I thought they both deserved to be in jail. I cleaned Ted and dressed him in his new clothes. Ted smiled for the first time and said, You're a lot nicer than the other babysitters so far. My mom often went out leaving me with the babysitter whenever my dad wasn't home. I combed the kid's hair and asked him if he would like to show his dad. I was expecting a joyful expression, but instead, I saw Ted's face changing color. His face turned all pale and scared. He replied, We shouldn't go to my dad's room. He scares me when he talks. In a confused tone, I asked how his own dad scared him. Ted looked around and then said in a low voice, His lips never move. He doesn't even blink his eyes. He just keeps staring and a voice comes out of him. I get scared when he does that. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I replied in a panicked voice, well, What do you mean? Ted replied with his mom, and the angry man shouted at his dad. His dad then told him to leave, and he heard fighting in his dad's room. But after some time, his mom and the angry man came out and left immediately. He said he went to his dad's room and saw him lying on his bed like that, and he said he didn't go to his room anymore. He just talks from the inside and Ted stands out near the closed door. His dad told him to wait for the next babysitter, and then he said surely someone would come after seeing the ads. I bolted out of the bathroom and rushed towards the bedroom where Mr. Saunders spoke to me. As I opened the door, a foul smell of dead flesh suffocated my lungs. I saw a rotten, dead body of a man laying on the bed. He was stabbed vigorously in the stomach. Blotted blood was all over the bed sheets and his clothes. His eyes were still wide open, looking directly at me. I came out of the room and felt sick to my stomach. Ted started to sob terribly seeing me react that way. He said in a sobbing voice, Don't get sick like Dad. Please, I'm scared of being here alone. I sat down and gathered my thoughts. I hugged Ted close to my chest and eventually called 911 and his grandmother. And the paramedics took out the dead body. Mrs. Saunders kept crying while holding her grandson. The cops investigated the case and the horrifying story shivered our town. Ted's mom had an affair with a drug dealer. Out of anger and frustration, Mr. Saunders denied and rebuked his wife for what she did. The argument led to a fight, and the drug dealer boyfriend stabbed Ted's dad to death. Due to the fear of getting caught, Ted's mom ran away with the drug dealer, leaving poor Ted all alone with his father's corpse. To this day, this story still terrifies me when I recall Mr. Saunders speaking to me at first when I arrived. 
I recently went to go visit Ted, and he's now living with his grandma. The kid looked a lot happier last time I saw him. His grandma told me to take the money, as I did do the babysitting job. She thanked me profusely, saying that without me her grandson would have died too. She then handed me the money, and I went home. I still don't know whether it was real or my mind playing some trick on my imagination, but whenever I close my eyes, I still remember how clearly the ghost of Mr. Saunders spoke to me that night.